Okay. Um, I believe we have everybody uh, that is going to indicate that they want to participate in the pre-hearing conference is here. So we can go ahead and get started a couple minutes early. My name is, I guess, I'll try to look at the camera. Um, my name is Josh Donabedi and I'm district coordinator uh, for districts five, six, and nine. This is obviously a district five matter. Um, just a couple of quick things before we get started. Um, as this is a mix of video participants and phone participants, um, just make sure to state your name before you, whenever, whenever you speak, each time you speak, um, state your name. And um, I guess for those that are participating via video, there is a chat option. So if you need to leave for step out for a few minutes, use the bathroom or take an emergency phone call or something, you can drop a note um, letting us know. And or if you have any any questions for me as this unfolds, uh, maybe you can drop a line in the chat and I can answer um, in there. Um, Otherwise, I will hand it over to the chair in this matter, Jeremy Reed. Thank you, Josh. Uh, just a couple housekeeping uh, points. If everybody could turn their uh, microphones to mute while um, they're not talking, uh, that'll just decrease on the background noise and echo. Good afternoon, my name is Jeremy Reed and today is Thursday, April 16th, 2020, and we are the District 5 Environmental Commission meeting remotely to conduct a pre-hearing conference on application number 5L1136-6 for a project described as phase three of an existing sand and gravel extraction operations on a 316 acre tract of town-owned lands. The proposed phase three gravel extraction area is set within an existing open field consisting of 8.77 acres located to the south of current and previous extraction areas. The project proposes a five phase 25 year operation for a total extraction of approximately 700,000 cubic yards with special projects of up to 6,000 cubic yards per year. The project is located at the end of Dumal Road and Morristown, Vermont. The overarching goal of pre-hearing conferences is to identify the parties to this proceeding and future proceedings and narrow the issues to be taken up at the merits hearing. The pre-hearing conferences are designed to ensure an orderly and complete presentation of evidence at a dis district commission hearing. The goal of the pre-hearing is to ensure that the district commission's hearing, a timely and comprehensive review of the ap application is accomplished. Following the conclusion of today's conference, we will issue a pre-hearing conference report and order. Again, my name is Jeremy Reed, and I serve as the Vice Chair of the District 5 Environmental Commission and Acting Chair in this matter. I'm joined today by Commissioners Matt Krause and Jocelyn Wilczek. Also joining us are our District 5 Coordinator Josh Donabedian and Aaron Brondike. Are there any disclosures or concerns that the parties have about the commissioner serving on this project? Hearing none, I would like to provide a reminder regarding ex parte communications outside of today's proceedings. All communications, whether by letter, email, or telephone must flow through Josh, our district coordinator, and not other parties of the commission members. I will ask the applicant shortly to give us an overview of what is being applied for in a few minutes, but first some comments on party status and the procedure for this pre-hearing conference. The following parties are eligible to participate in this proceeding and future proceedings. Statutory parties are municipals, municipal planning commissions, regional planning commissions, any adjacent municipality or municipal planning commissions, regional planning commissions if the project lands are located within a town boundary and affected state agencies are entitled to party status. Adjoining property owners and others may participate as parties to the extent they have a particularized interest that may be affected by the proposed project under one of the 10 criteria. And just to clarify, we're discussing only amendment number six uh, issues. 
non-party participants, the district commission on its own motion or by petition may allow other per others to participate as a friend of the commission in the hearing without being afforded party status. In this manner, the parties are encouraged to disclose their arguments and evidence in advance, and the commission may prohibit new arguments and evidence from being raised at the hearing. The procedure we will be using for this pre-hearing conference is as follows. A project overview, where the applicant will present a brief overview of the project. Preliminary party status, we will consider requests from individuals or organized groups seeking party status or other participation rights and determine under which criteria they may be admitted. The dis district commission may recess if necessary to decide preliminary party status. Once preliminary party status is resolved, we will go through the following criteria, which the commission has identified as potential, potential issues. Criterion one, air pollution. Criterion two and three, water supply. Criterion five, transportation. Criterion eight, scenic beauty, historic sites and natural areas. Criterion nine D and nine E, earth resources. Criterion nine K, public investments. Criterion 10, town plan. And we will also take the opportunity to identify any other issues or concerns. So with that, the conference is officially called to order. And I will uh, ask the applicant to give a brief overview of the project and uh, outline the objectives. Thank you, Jeremy. This is Tyler Mumley with Mumley Engineering, uh, representing the applicant, the town of Morristown, uh, for this application. And uh, I'll be doing the, the majority of the, the discussion here and talking about the project and answering any questions as we move forward. Um, Dan Lindley, town administrator, is also here, as, as well as uh, the town of Morristown Select Board. But as you mentioned, uh, this is an application for Phase three of the Town of Morristown's uh, gravel pit operations located at the end of Duhamel Road in Morristown. Um, it's a large property, uh, over 300 acres, uh, and over the last few decades, there have been uh, phase one and phase two in this area. This is a proposal for phase three, which is located in an existing meadow area on the same property. Um, with uh, multiple phases proposed over the next uh, 25 years for extraction of, of uh, gravel and sand. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd like to, to know, uh, Jeremy, how, how in-depth you'd like uh, a review to be provided right now. So, Tyler, I think um, if, if you've been, I think you know sort of the uh, criteria that we're looking for. So if you can touch on the project's uh, impacts to those criteria and, and not necessarily get into the fine details, but at least discuss what the applicants uh, sort of mitigation measures and thoughts are on the criteria that I listed. Uh, and again, those are criterion one, two, three, five, eight, nine D, nine E, nine K and 10. Um, and we can certainly help sort of um, continue that conversation if there's any gaps in, in your presentation. Okay, will do. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, this is phase three. And so the town has been operating in the phase two area uh, and, and continues to operate in the phase two area. What has been proposed for phase three is a continuation of all the same operation procedures, but basically just in a different location. And so the majority of the operational procedures and, and the way things are done out there will continue to happen. Uh, we're not looking for any changes in how operations occur or uh, timing of operations or durations of operations. Again, it's just a, a relocation of the actual pit area. So. Uh, a lot of the things I'm going to say and a lot of the things that are presented in the application are basically an explanation of how things have been happening out there for many years 
and how they will continue to happen just in a new location. So uh, with regard to air pollution, um, I mean, I guess it's really just a discussion of, of how things happen out there. So uh, they, the, the pit operates by having, you know, some equipment out there that handles uh, the excavation and then trucks come and go uh, from the town garage into the pit location where they get loaded up and they, and they bring the stone uh, and materials out of the pit. So from an air and pollution standpoint, um, any kind of dust abatement will happen using water um, uh, or other methods to keep the dust down uh, as far as air pollution goes. From a noise standpoint, um, some measures have happened in the past to help try to abate uh, the amount of noise out there. For example, we've uh, installed radar on the backup uh, for the backups of the, the equipment so that uh, the backup beeping noise only happens when there's actually something behind the equipment so that that beep beep and the backup doesn't occur all the time. Um, as we mentioned in the application, uh, a test was conducted to, uh, to put a loader up in the area of phase three uh, and then we visited some areas around uh, the town property uh, and listened for the the noise of the the loader operating and it backing up with uh, with the beep beep noise happening in reverse uh, and the sound was uh, barely audible uh, in most locations um, and at no point did it did it come to a level that was of, of concern or of significance uh, there is a crusher that is used at the site uh, for a three week period each summer um, just as it has been in years past. Um, again, much like has happened in phase one and two, the pit itself um, is a pit. You know, it's self-contained within itself. So as the operations are happening, uh, for the most part, they are operating within the pit, um, basically with with uh, basically you know, self self created walls, you might call it, because of the pit walls themselves, as, as it is a self contained pit. Um, there's also a screening material. Uh, a screening machine uh, to help with screening, and so that is also uh, in the pit during operations. The hours of operation uh, of the pit are from 7 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. Monday through Friday between March 1st and December 1st, except as necessary to respond to natural disasters and weather-related emergencies, and that remains the same as, as it has for, for, for many years. Um, as far as Criterion 1 goes, um, I think that is, covers uh, the majority of uh, what was discussed in the application. Moving on to Criterion 2. Uh, actually, I guess the question uh, for you, Jeremy, um, Criterion 1 is air pollution, but you did not mention 1A, 1B, and so on and so forth. Um, are those specifically excluded in the agenda today? No. So the, the intent was not to specifically exclude stuff necessarily, but this is what we um, identified. So would you like uh, me to discuss criterion 1A, 1B, 1C, 1D, and so on, or, or is just the discussion of Criterion one air pollution. What what was looking for? Yeah, I think think what you've done is is adequate for for what we've pulled out for um, likely issues. Okay, great. Um, then I'll move on to criterion two and three water supply. Uh, so the, the the project itself um, does not require any water supply. The only water that would be used would be for dust abatement. Uh, which would be trucked into the site uh, by the town. Um, there are adjacent uh, water supplies. Um, the first of those that I'll address is uh, regarding the 10 bath area, um, the properties to the north. Um, they are close to the existing phase two area. 
and uh, during the phase two application and permitting process years ago, um, a hydrogeologist was hired by the town to analyze that and, and provided an analysis uh, that summarized that there was no proposed or no expected impacts to water supply sources in that area to the north. And um, to today's date, we are unaware of, of any impacts that have uh, may have happened or have been explained to have happened. So we're not aware that I mean, any impacts have happened thus far to 10 bends or are expected to happen. The proposed phase three area is located uh, to the south of the existing phase two, so it's further away from the 10 bends area than the existing phase two area, and therefore also not expected to have any impacts to uh, those water supplies. And further details and information uh, is, is included in the existing uh, permit and, and supporting documentations of 5L1136-5, uh, which was the permit for phase two. Uh, the other water supply um, is the spring well for the Avery property, uh, which is located to the east uh, of the proposed phase three area um, this spring well of Mr. Avery's has been uh, a topic in past applications and permits as well, and so we're very aware of it and have uh, addressed it accordingly. There is a defined um, buffer area, an isolation area, based on previous and forestry management plans, which includes um, areas around it which are delineated by stakes in the ground and, and GPS locations that are recorded and have been shown in the plans. Furthermore, um, using today's standards for isolation zones of spring wells, uh, we've delineated those areas on the plans as well. And the proposed uh, phase three pit area is outside of those limits. Uh, furthermore, uh, we completed an analysis, um, both from surface and groundwater, uh, hydrogeological analysis uh, of the well and, and potential impacts of the, the proposed pit on the well. Um, Mumley Engineering completed an analysis, and a second analysis was also completed by Ross Environmental Associates, uh, both finding that there was very low likelihood of any impacts, both from quality and quantity, uh, impacts to the existing spring well of Mr. Avery's. Um, I could go in depth, uh, Jeremy, if you'd like, on the actual analysis that was completed, or should we? I move think on? for I, I think for overview purposes, this is fine. Okay. Again. Um, is this thing on? Is this thing on? Excuse me? I was just making sure I was connected. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I'll just, I would also mention that uh, in the submittal of this application, there are, uh, again, two exhibits provided, uh, two independent uh, analysis of uh, the, the proposed gravel pit and the existing Avery well. There's also a site plan uh, sketch that was provided that shows uh, the well, both from a cross-sectional view and a site plan view, that supports uh, those, those analysis. Uh, moving on to Criterion 5, transportation. Um, again, not any changes from previous years. Um, so. You know, the, the amount of gravel extraction per year uh, will remain the same. The, the operations will remain the same, the same trucks and the same uh, limit of trips. Um, and so there'll be no, no changes. Again, it's just gonna be a, a physical change within the pit of the, actual, of the actual gravel extraction area. But the way the trucks operate uh, and the traffic that is generated from this project uh, will be the same as it has existed uh, for many years. 
should also mention in the transportation uh, that uh, we are we also reference that there are recreational trails within the property itself. Uh, there is an existing parking area along Dewhamel Road. Um, the town has been in discussion uh, with the property owners there, um, and we'll be working with those property owners to uh, put in place an easement to allow the continuation of that parking area to be there. It, it extends out of the town right away onto their property, and so an easement will will be put in place with those property owners to allow that parking location to stay there as is and allow uh, the public to utilize that parking area to access the property. Um, and there's no change there. Again, that, that, that's how it's been existing for many years. It's been in use like that for many years. There's no proposed changes to how the land is used from a public standpoint and for recreation. And there's no, there's no changes expected to happen as a result of this. Um, so the traffic that has been experienced, you know, along Dewhamel Road and off of Katy Falls Road uh, will remain as is uh, moving into this new phase. Uh, moving on to Criterion 8, um, we did a lot of work. Uh, working with the state, uh, various A and R departments at the state. Um, again, it's a it's a large piece of land, and it has a lot of different aspects to it. We met with many different people from the state to review any potential impacts. Um, the people that we met with was Scott Dillon, survey archaeologist from the state. Um, we walked the site. And it was decided that there was potential potential for the site to have sensitivity towards uh, historical and archaeological aspects, and so we conducted a, um, a site assessment and conducted a plow in, in some certain areas as identified by Scott. And then Scott um, and one of his colleagues walked the site, and they did not find anything uh, that would uh, that would warrant you know sensitivity for uh, arche archaeological concerns. Uh, and so Scott uh, basically signed off on the project from uh, from that standpoint. Uh, we also walked the property with the Fish and Game uh, Department, Fish and Wildlife from the state. There were some concerns uh, from Noel Dodge uh, with fish and, fish and Wildlife, primarily with deer wintering areas on the southern part of the property. And we have added to the plan that the southern portion of the property will be um, excluded from recreational use during winter months so as to avoid um, any concerns uh, or impacts to the deer wintering areas in that, in that area of the property. Um, Old Dodge also had some concerns about um, providing additional information to the public, uh, the users of the, the site from the, of the public uh, regarding you know, keeping dogs on, on their leash and again just being sensitive to, uh, to those areas, those zero wintering areas. Um, also met with uh, Shannon Morrison from the Wetlands Department, walked the site and she had uh, no concerns about it, uh, no wetlands within the area of the proposed phase three area itself. Um, towards the south of the project, there were some areas that she would like to potentially look at in the future um, because the southern part of phase three uh, won't be, we won't get there for many, many years. You know, the, life of the, the life of the pit is expected to be 25 years, so we wouldn't get down to that area uh, for some time. And as, as uh, Shannon would tell you, you know, we like, they like to look at wetlands every five years, so um, there may be there may be concerns in the future, um, and she wants to be able to stay on top of it. But as of right now, for the majority of the phase three area, and especially the early phases of that of phase three, um, there are no concerns. Uh, the one concern, the one item she did present, and it's a, a topic we can discuss with ANRs in streams, is there's a, a stream 
that exists out there is not identified at the state level as a blue line stream, uh, but it exists as a stream. It's on the southerly portion of the phase three area. Um, there's there's adequate separation distance provided between the stream and the phase three traction area, uh, but it, it may be something um, that the A and R uh, folks would like to to have addressed specifically. Um, generally, from a uh, you know scenic beauty historic site natural area discussion, um, the area of the land, the approximate nine acres of land that are that are slotted for phase three. Um, is an open meadow area, um, so there's no trees that will be uh, cut. There's very limited clearing. The, the, the majority of the clearing is minimal. It's for the entrance road that would come in uh, basically through the old phase one area into the phase three area. So that would really be the only clearing. The, exist, the, the existing area of proposed phase three is, is open in a meadow area uh, and it slopes across the site. Uh, also, in the plans, we provided uh, like basically a viewshed analysis, um, taking locations around the area and town that could possibly have a view site onto the property. Uh, we took five locations um, and analyzed those and provided the, the results there, showing that uh, for the most part, the proposed phase three area is not visible. Uh, from those locations, in prox you know, in the, located in the proximity of this of the of the Duhamel Pit. Just looking over the application, to make sure I'm not missing anything. I think that was it. Uh, as far as criteria and eight is concerned, and I think I also stepped into. Criteria in 8A there is a little bit as well in the discussion with um, Fish and Wildlife. Uh, moving on to 9D and 9E, um, you know, I think it's just a discussion about the general operations of the project. Um, you know, currently we're proposing five phases the site. Um, the beginning of the project includes cutting a new haul road from basically the existing entrance into the into the pit area through what was formerly fa the phase one area and using kind of the side hill of phase one uh, to cut into and up and in, up into the phase three area. Uh, so that would be the initial step was to get the, the haul road in there and then phase one would begin at the basically northeast corner of the phase three area and then the initial the rest of the remaining phases uh, two three four and five would move you know to the south and uh, west and further south Expecting, well, we are proposing, in accordance with previous approvals, uh, 25,000 cubic yards per year to be hauled out of the gravel pit, plus an additional 6,000 cubic yards per year for special projects, uh, as was approved in, in, in past uh, permanent amendments of this of this permit. Um, based on uh, a cut fill analysis, we expect there to be about 70,000. 700,000 cubic yards of material, um, excluding the top two feet of topsoil um, in the pit. So that's where we get the rough estimate of about 25 years for the life of the, the life of the pit itself, uh, the phase three area. Uh, talk about reclamation a little bit. Uh, the proposed reclamation is the same as has been uh, conducted and as was approved in previous applications and permits, uh, that a two to one slope uh, would be provided um, after after the gravel has been extracted. Um, we talked about providing appropriate delineation of the project limits um, around the gravel pit area. 
providing tilt fence on downhill areas to prevent any um, washout from the top of the berm downward. Otherwise, uh, from a stormwater runoff standpoint, the pit itself will be self-contained. You should also note that we are we have applied for and received a draft permit for a multi-sector general permit from the state stormwater department. Um, that permit is typically unnecessary for gravel pits that are self-containing, like this this perm like this project will be. Um, both phase one, phase two, and proposed phase three are all self-containing. However, because of the existing haul road that comes in from Duhamel Road, um, because there are there's an existing road, the existing discharges there, that was the catalyst for the state requiring a multi-sector general permit. Um, and so there are three discharge locations along that entrance road uh, coming up from Duhamel, from the Duhamel Road. Uh, and those will be the testing locations as part of the multi-sector general permit. But uh, as defined in that application and that permit, the pit itself will be self-containing for any stormwater runoff. Um, regarding 9K public investment, uh, the track is land. The track of land is owned by the town of Morristown, um, but to the south um, is, is land owned by Vermont Department of Fish and Game. Uh, where that land, where the Fish and Game land abuts the town of Morristown land, is is very far to the south uh, of this property. Uh, basically, like an entire track of land between Phase Three and, and this area. Um, and the, the fish and game land kind of wraps up and around along the, the river. Um, but all in all, there, there are no expected impacts on that land. And furthermore, you know, we've talked with, with fish and wildlife uh, as far as impacts uh, to, to wildlife go. And there's, you know, we've taken the measures that they've recommended, including limitation of winter recreational activities in that southern portion of land, which abuts um, the majority of that fish and game property. Uh, the last criteria I believe you mentioned was uh, Criterion 10 local and regional plans. Uh, from a regional standpoint, uh, we did have a meeting with uh, LCPC, Memorial County Planning Commission, uh, last week, and they they gave uh, approval for the project as it meets you know, the regional planning uh, goals that they have also meets uh, the local town goals, the local town plan from both the utilities and facilities plan perspective as well as from uh, productive resources. Okay, that, thank you. Uh, covers it. Obviously, there's a lot of additional details in those areas and uh, did not cover all the criteria, but um, I think for the most part, we covered the, the main points of the application. Yep, Th thank you, Tyler, I appreciate it. Um, at this point, I'm going to ask Josh to, to give me a hand. And if you uh, would uh, sort of introduce those who you know to be interested in obtaining parity status, and then we can let those individuals uh, discuss under what criteria and what their particularized interest is in this project. So, Josh, could you um, list off, probably starting with the statutory um, entitled parties? Yep, so okay. First, um, one bit of important housekeeping. Um, I We for, forgot to announce this at the beginning, but it's important to let everybody know that um, A, we, the District Commission, are recording this pre-hearing conference and it will be uploaded and available on the public record in our Act 250 database. Also, Green Mountain Access Television is participating in the call as a, as a non-party and it is my understanding that they will be um, airing 
this screener conference in one form, form or another on public access television. So I just want to let everybody know that, that you are being recorded. Um, okay, and so now we're moving on to the preliminary party status portion of, of the of the conference. Um, yep, first. Right. Can, I make, can I make in here for a second? Hey, this is Tommy from the News and Citizen. We're also recording it, so just to let you know. Can you say that again, please? Tommy Gardner from the News and Citizen. We're also recording it just for uh, uh, just if if you had to mention that for GMA TV. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I'll unmute myself. Okay, so for statutory parties, we obviously have the applicant, um, which itself is a statutory party, um, the town of Morristown. Um, Tyler indicated that the select board also seeks to um, be a party in this matter. Um, Tyler indicated that the Regional Planning Commission, um, he met with the Regional Planning Commission and they did submit comments on the other day saying, um, con confirming what uh, Tyler mentioned that the, it is their determination that this project complies with the Regional Plan. Um, other statutory parties are, first would be the Agency of Natural Resources and Jen Mojo. Um, Jen, is there any particular criterion you are interested in, in discussing or commenting on today, or are you just participating from a general perspective? Uh, this is Jen Mojo from Agency of Natural Resources. Thanks, Josh. Um, we have preliminarily reviewed the application materials, and I provided some feedback back to the applicant uh, yesterday. Our preliminary uh, criteria of interest are criteria one, air pollution, Criteria 1E streams. Um, let's see, criteria, and this is sort of a combination of them 1B, 3, 9D, 9E, and criterion 8A wildlife. And some of um, the applicant's description mentioned the issues that we had raised. Um, and I, I don't know what the commission is considering in terms of a site visit, but that is something that the agency would be interested in performing either as a group or we can schedule that on our own um, once the stay at home restrictions are lifted. So that's something that we would ultimately be asking for though. Okay, and also another statutory party is the um, Division for Historic Preservation represented by Scott Dillon. Scott, anything in particular you'd like to discuss today or general participant? Um, obviously, we're interested in the historic sites criteria of, or historic sites aspect of Criterion 8. Um, as Tyler summarized, we did um, conduct site visits and actually uh, we did uh, what amounts to a phase one site identification last year. Um, with negative results, as, as again, he summarized. Um, so we don't have any remaining archaeological concerns with this proposal, and we'll be filing a comment letter to that effect um, after this pre-hearing conference. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, next, we will be moving on to adjoining property owner, owners um, and organizations. And first I'll say, as I go through each one of you, um, please state your name, your address, uh, and the. If you're not certain what criteria your concerns fall under, that is one of the goals of the purposes of this conference is is uh, for us to assist you in um, identifying which criteria your con your um, concerns do fall under. So it's okay if you, if you um, can't be specific on that level. Um, but please be brief with each of your concerns. And then as the commission walks back through each of the criteria of concern, that's when the commissioners will ask questions and allow for your comments under each uh, relevant criterion. This is Commissioner Jocelyn Wilczek. I just, Jeremy, we, to be efficient here, um, we have, I don't know how you want to proceed here, but we have reviewed, we've received and reviewed the party status request from a number of adjoining landowners and um, the 10 Benz organization. So I don't necessarily know if those folks need to 
basically read what they already sent us. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I guess my thought was if they wanted to provide a little bit more context, we just had a, a paragraph from each essentially that I think was submitted. Um, yeah, I think Josh sort of touched on it there. We're not looking for a dissertation here. Just a brief summary of, of what your particularized interest is um, and and what criterion or, or what component, if you don't know what criteria, um, that particularized interest would apply to. Okay, um, so again, please state your name, your address, and um, very brief uh, items that you're concerned about. We will start with Don Avery. Did you say Don and Lila? Yes, Don, yep, the Averys. The Averys, okay, good. Uh, my name is Don Avery, and I live at 637 Dew Hamill Road in Morrisville. Um, I'm uh, on the uh, uh, downhill uh, joiner to the uh, a gravel pit, and the, uh, pit, the all the traffic to the pit goes across right away across our land. A good portion of the water that comes off of the property comes right across our land. I've been involved with this gravel pit since 1984. I've been through all the sort of permutations of permits and, and some years without permits, I should say. Um, so over the years, uh, I think we've done, I, don't want, I want to be brief here, but I have a bunch of years to jam in. I think we've been real successful in getting permit conditions that have worked and then town's gotten what they need and that's become, uh, really a, a workable situation for everybody. Um, at this point, um, I have, uh, I have a few, I have a few concerns. They're pretty limited. Um, I'm, bro I'm broadly concerned about a lot of things, but there's only a few issues that I think I should bring up actually for party status. Um, the first issue that I have is, is um, you may have to tell me how you want to deal with this. Um, it's a stream issue under criteria 1E and potentially 4, and this is not specifically part of the town's actual um, amendment application, but it, it's tangled up in the um, general multi-sector permit issue. And I, I don't, not exactly sure how that actually interfaces with Act 250 at this time. I've never had experience with that. Um, what we have is just right above my barn uh, as the town goes through their gate. Uh, this, now, if you want to look at this, this would be on, um, let's see, this would be on the overall site plan C2, exhibit 013A. And in the upper right corner, there's a blow up of this location that I'm referring to. Should I, should I go ahead or wait for people to get that on their screen or? Yeah, go ahead because I'm not sure everybody would have access to that handily. So I don't oh. think we need to wait. And, and certainly there's people participating via telephone okay, only. So. Okay, good. Um, I'll try to be as brief as I can. The, um, the, as you go uh, through the town gate, uh, um, you're still on my property and you get up to the edge of the property. There's a culvert um, that crosses under the road, 50 foot culvert, and that drains the, the largest stream, the only real major significant stream on the property. And that's the subject uh, of this general multi service, multi sector permit. Um, we have a situation there, though, which is very odd, uh, in that for years and years, in major storm events, uh, of course, that, that culvert is, you know, is now really built for major storm events, as many culverts aren't. So we've had uh, some massive flooding that's come down from up in there when the culvert gets filled up. But what's happened in recent years is the slightly upstream from that culvert, the uh, it has been now very tremendously plugged up, not in the culvert but just upstream with a massive amount of gravel and uh, trees and brush and, uh, and 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 trees, alders and things growing in there. So what happens now is the culvert no longer the, the main function of the culvert is to funnel the stream under the pit access road, but it no longer performs that function the way it's supposed to. So when now when we get uh, even we could go ahead six tenths of an inch of rain, the water backs up because of that all that gravel and so on, and it flows out of the bank in the direction of our barn, which is about fifty. I'm just going to say fifty feet away, and it flows right onto our property and goes down onto the town. Uh, road and then flows out into our field and into the parking lot for the nursery. Um, so there's an issue there that uh, really needs to be attended to. It's sort of like, um, I don't know, maybe uh, just housekeeping that hasn't been done in recent years. It's sort of got ahead of the town. Uh, I'm, I just simply propose that we have the A&R look at that and try to come up with a good solution that works. Uh, Tyler was there one day, uh, came by to talk to me about something, and he stood there and saw that happening. I think he 
probably would agree that there's an issue that has to be dealt with. I think it's just it's more than the town can actually deal with. So it would make sense to have the uh, uh, have the A and R involved in that and just figure out how to how to solve that problem. Mr. Avery, um, this is Jocelyn Wilczek. I just had a question for you. Is it your belief that the gravel that's in this stream is from the existing gravel operation? No, it's not. It's um, it, I, I, I can't find any connection at all. No, 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 not that. It's it's just a natural deposit of you know massive storms come down. And the last the last storm we had was that Halloween storm was four inches of rain, and that just that sort of the last straw is sort of filling up that whole zone with gravel. So I guess what I'm just trying to understand is what you just explained that you've observed. Is there any relationship with the stream being backed up and the project? The only relationship is that the, the culvert that goes under the road that, that serves the entire town property, um, the town, I mean, the access to the entire uh, gravel pit project, is is uh, its its function is to funnel that stream water under that road, and it doesn't work anymore. And now it's funneling it over the road and down onto my property. So it's only the functionality of that culvert that's part of that road system is just no longer working. Is the culvert part of the quarry project? Um, the culvert is, is li lies exactly on the line between my property and the town property, and it was installed for the gravel pit. Okay. Um, and it's part it's part of that infrastructure. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, okay. Do you want me to continue? Yes, please. Yeah, so, so so any other concerns you have? And, and again, just to, to clarify and not to cut anybody off, but we're not necessarily taking taking testimony at this point, just trying to get yeah. a feel for what the concerns are. Yeah, I was trying to be brief, but it's complicated. Okay, thank you very much. Um, okay, the, the I would say the real big concern for me is the proximity of the, of the gravel pit and uh, to our aquifer. Um, the, the Sparm Spring is what we're talking about that Tyler mentioned. And this would be under criteria three and criteria nine. And uh, um, I have uh, hired a uh, hydrogeologist by the name of Jeff Hoffer, who's um, been working with me to try to understand this. And I can give you just a statement, uh, two sentences from him that sort of sums up what we've come up with here. He says that preliminary delineation of the recharge area of the Avery Spring indicates that the spring most likely derives a large portion of the recharge from the land area targeted for excavation by the town. I will be providing a review of the applicant's hydrogeological evaluations, and I'll provide recommendations on how the project can be modified to minimize the impacts on the Avery Spring. Um, so that's that's where we're moving with that. Um, uh, I would say that for the most part, our issues are almost I would say almost entirely limited to phase five. Okay. So, so just to clarify, there, Mr. Avery, this is Jeremy Reed. Um, so, so when you just quoted the the um, geohydrologist, yeah, that wasn't necessarily related to phase three, but specifically yes. phase five. Um, we're related. All, it's all of phase three because the you know the lines are randomly drawn across there. They don't necessarily correspond to the, the aquifer. Um, but I, I, I said sort of parenthetically, that's that's really where the tar it's, it's the extreme south end of the of the excavation. And we're totally in favor of, of most of the excavation. Just that south end is worrisome, and we're just coming to terms with that. And this and the state has uh, uh, I, uh, Jennifer didn't mention it, but my understanding is the state has asked for some additional borings uh, on that on that southern end, so that we get a better idea of where the water table is. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Um, another issue that I have, um, again, it's not part of this particular application, but I'd like to just explain it, and we may be able to deal with this somehow. From the very beginning, from the very early, early permits, it was determined that you know there is uh, um, a great potential for what they described as unnecessary truck rack racket going past our home and our nursery here. And um, we've just tried to come to terms with that. We've done pretty well. But we've, we've long ago identified the truck, the beds, tr the tr truck beds slamming that are, are an issue with only some trucks and only when the road is deteriorated in certain ways. But it can be a tremendous racket. And we've tried to deal with it. And it was addressed in the 92 permit amendment 
uh, when the town bought their first ten wheelers because the ten wheelers are more prone to that problem. And it was, and at that point they determined they're going to put in some double pistons. One, the one set of pistons holds them up, holds the bed up, one holds it down, uh, and that was going to solve. Well, then they, after by the time we got 2004 to the First Amendment, or uh, actually the Phase Two, I should say, they determined that there were really no hydraulic pistons that did that job. That was not really real. So they determined well we should put in rubber wedges and shims and so on. Well, for the last years that hasn't happened either. So all I'm asking is that maybe we could revisit that and try to have a better uh, a better approach so that myself and the and the town uh, the town road foreman and the administrator could just try to identify that problem and come to terms with it um, once and for all. Uh, it's it's sort of a moving target because the trucks change and the road conditions change, but it makes a huge difference in the aesthetics here or in the in the in the noise racket. Some of the trucks are perfectly silent and some of them are really really loud. So I, I would just like to revisit that and move forward with that, and I, I think we can. If we get get everybody on board, the problem is there's the town administrator, then there's a road, town highway foreman, and then there's a village foreman. So everybody has to be committed to it, and I haven't made, been able to make that happen in the past. Okay, um, so I would say I, I have a couple of sort of one just thing to mention to you in the in anywhere in the old permit when it says Turrell Road or it says Town Highway 10, that is now Duhamel Road. It, there was confusion 30 years ago, and there still could be now. So just just so that you know that the other, I just ha I have a suggestion. Um, this is my last thing I'm going to say here. Um, I feel like the the sort of numerical terminology that's being used in the application to identify the uh, the phases of phase three could cause some confusion either during the hearing or in the future when people try to unravel the, the decision. Uh, what what they what we have is the old phase one and the old phase two and then we have phase three. But inside phase three, we're having phase one, two, three, four, and five. So I would propose to refer to those instead of as just plain, say for example, phase one in phase three. Let's I would just propose to call it phase one dash. I'm sorry, uh, phase three dash one. Or phase three dash five. Otherwise, we'll be talking. We could be at cross purposes trying to understand what areas we're uh, referring to. And that's that's all for me. Okay, thank you, Don. Um, and I certainly uh, appreciate that that last suggestion. Um, I found myself being a little bit confused uh, at yeah. first as well. Um, so to summarize, it seems as as though you've expressed concerns under criterion 1e um, kind of a hybrid concern 1e and 4 for streams and soil erosion regarding the culvert um, just beyond the gate to the pit um, criterion 2 and 3 your concerns regarding um, proximity of, of, of phase 3 operations to your aquifer and criterion 5 uh, issues with truck noise um, well, in the past, we've always done the noise under aesthetics or extraction of earth resources. Uh, okay, yeah, five, five and eight. Um, yeah. So let's move on to the next individual, who is Nick Crandall. Nick, please um, state your address and your role with uh, the Ten Bends organization. Hey, Josh, how are you? Um, Thanks for the opportunity to speak and represent the Lamoille Valley Property Owners Association, otherwise known as Ten Bends. Our our mailing address is Post Office Box 53 in Hyde Park, Vermont, 05655. Um, I am the president and represent the association and board as a whole. One quick question: Am I representing the abutting landowners that submitted? Uh, the documentation to you as well, or are they speaking on their own behalf? Um, at, at first, I thought that that might make sense from a you know efficiency and um, smoothness standpoint, but I think it's best to have everybody you know speak for themselves, and then we'll go through the you know the process of of, of preliminary party status and final party status, and um, perhaps perhaps in, in future proceedings it may be best. To have you speak on everybody's behalf, um, but for now we'll, we'll we'll go through one by one. Understood. Thank you. Um, 
So the board has kind of formalized our concerns around the 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 permit application. And to be brief, um, though I can't connect them directly with your criterion, I'm sure you can do so on your end. It begins with noise pollution. Um, we can hear the current operations um, as they exist in the the current pit. And we want to make that clear that operations can be audibly heard during their operations from our homes. And while we understand that the operation is moving further southward and, and, and distance further away from our home, we are concerned that we will still be able to hear the operations uh, of the gravel pit. Um, and we are concerned with the elevated site of the extraction, uh, new extraction as it compares with the existing and how that will possibly increase the the ability for us to hear it at our homes. Um, going along with that, um, we are concerned with the noise level of the crusher as it is the loudest um, device that is being used, um, though we do appreciate any uh, efforts are that are being implemented to to decrease the sounds of, of backup alarms as alliterated in the application. Um, so, Mr. Crandall, this is Jeremy Reed. I, just a clarifying question. So you, you gave your address, but uh, fair to say that the majority of the homeowners are north of the pit or south, just trying to orient where um, where the, your constituents are. Ab absolutely. And I can speak a little bit to our mission statement, too, in that explanation, if you'd like. Um, the Moyle Valley Property Owners Association, or 10 bends, otherwise known as 10 bends, is, is located to the north of the gravel pit and resides in both Morristown, Vermont, and also Hyde Park. So our common area association lands uh, straddle the Lamoille River on both the Morristown and Lamo and Hyde Park sides, and residents take are, um, are located on both Morristown and Hyde Park sides, all north of the, the pit. Um, yes, all north to the pit, north of the pit. Um, would you like me to briefly explain uh, who we are as a, as, as a mission statement of an organization, or do, would you like me to move past that for now? Yeah, I think we can skip that for now. I'm just trying to understand yep. uh, Geography. You yep. know, your, your relation to the pit and as it related to some of your concerns. Sure. Um, moving on, like I said, we are in close proximity to the existing operation, though we will be a little further away from the proposed new site. The hours of operation are a bit of a concern to us as the uh, as they are outlined in the application as beginning at 7 a.m. And they do uh, affect our daily, daily lives, and we would like for that to be known. Um, it is earlier than most um, for, for some to be listening to that happening uh, outside their homes. Um, so that is a part of our concern. And... Um, uh, we, we we were wondering, I can get into this later, but we were wondering if this is a, a change from current uh, schedule. It seems like it's not. Um, and if the uh, current uh, the proposed schedule is greater than that of the existing. Um, the use of the land, we, we are concerned with the, I understand the clarification, um, we are concerned with the recreation that takes place on town lands as it often spills over onto our private lands. It's not our greatest concern, but it is something that we wanted to bring up in this application procedure. Um, we are also concerned with safety. As it is close to our homes, we we do find ourselves um, on town property as well as other residents of the town. And we often find it unclear as to where there is a hazard, um, where the pit is, is, and where it is safe to walk with children or ourselves. Um, so additional marking and of the site would be uh, helpful. Um, water supply, uh, I know was addressed earlier by Tyler Munley. Thank you, Tyler. Um, we are, despite the, the explanation and the application's explanation, we are concerned with fossil contaminants reaching our private wa uh, water supplies. And we are hoping that um, baseline and additional testing can be you know, added to the permit so that we can be under we can begin to understand <clears throat> the effects of of this activity on our water supplies, as there have been um, a, a couple of uh, uh, deaths in the community as a result of of cancer. Um, environmental stewardship is our last concern, um, namely um, how the the property is left when the pit is is is, is 
uh, extinct or are no longer being extracted upon, uh, how if it's just grasses, the slope, and we would hope that that it would be returned to, you know, some sort of state that that it was prior to the extraction, the addition of trees and not simply grading and grasses is really what we're talking about or hoping for. Uh, and lastly, and maybe the most important uh, is is invasive species. We're an, an association that um, prides ourselves on our forests and our uh, floodplains and our rivers, and and we see uh, invasive species moving into our our forests and our and our floodplains and our streams, and and we're concerned that that the contamination as a result of uh, the operations at the Duhamel gravel pit will move further into our community, and um, we can go further into that at a you know as we're able to expound. Great, thank uh, you. Okay, thank you, Nick. Oh, um, sorry, Jocelyn. Summer, summer I, I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I just wanted to circle back just for efficiency because it's 5.30 and we haven't gotten to the commission's issues. And I was thinking for purposes of efficiency, we'd like to circle back to the suggestion that if the adjoining landowners who are part of this group have, are indeed all adjoining landowners and have nothing in addition to add, that we don't ask each of them to speak because I think it's going to take a long time, but maybe we ask people to speak if they had an additional issue that wasn't already um, articulated very um, efficiently by the last speaker. Good, good suggestion. And, and I, I think it's um, a good, good one. Let's um, Josh, if you want to call on the, the individuals and see if they have anything to add to Mr. Crandall's um party status requests yep so uh, i do want to go through and, and get at least get everybody's address um so and yes to uh i guess reiterate what jocelyn and, and and jeremy have said if you have anything to add in addition to what nick said please do so otherwise if, if your concerns have already been um reflected in in, in his overview um, we'll just get your name and address and move along so next would be jennifer kramer Um, yeah, hi, this is uh, Jennifer Kramer, and Paul Keating here, and we have a cabin at 1092 River Ridge, and we abut the Morristown Forest land. Um, we are very content with uh, <clears throat> Nick Randall has to say. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next would be Stephen Donahoe. Donahue, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. I apologize if I just got it wrong. Donahoe. I just uh, have one thing to add to what Nick said, and I'm an 826 River Ridge Road, adjacent property owner. Uh, I'm concerned about the buffer zone between uh, my property and the new gravel pit. Uh, the application doesn't really talk about the buffer zone between our property and the uh, gravel pit. On the gravel pit and back to the dirt. And we've always had to address adjacent property buffer zones. Uh, and I just hope to that expanded on. Thank you. Um, just a clarifying question. This is Commissioner Jocelyn Wilchuk, so we can see where your concerns fall within the criteria potentially. Is your concern with the buffer an issue of aesthetics, meaning what you can see? Is it an issue of sound? Um, well, I think it's sound, sight, and uh, a sight from an aesthetic standpoint, and also from a safety standpoint. You know, we talk about that trail and we've spent time out on those trails, and we have friends and family visited us. And as you approach the existing gravel pit, I mean, there's not even any signs from our property and you're right at the edge of the gravel pit with a substantial drop, Not, you know, which I find very uh, dangerous that there's not a, a fence or a burn buffer zone with signs saying danger, a steep fall ahead. I think they had one sign to the west of the existing gravel pit. 
it's just, you know, it just doesn't seem like it's, uh, you know, it's a pretty deep pit, the existing pit. And Thank you. That's, that's where my concern is. Thank you. Thank you. And that's all I had. Okay. And uh, Jude Prashaw is next. She sent me a note that um, Nick has, has accurately re reflected her concerns. But Jude, if you don't mind, if we could just get um, your address for the record, please. Yes. Um, this is Jude Prashaw. It's 1034 River Ridge Road, Morrisville, 05655. All right, thank you very much. Um, so now we will transition back to um, the commission and we're gonna go back through all the criterion um, that we discussed at the top and then um, ones that have been, you know, any, any different ones that have been raised. And this is where they'll ask questions and perhaps ask for elaboration. And um, if you have any, any, any further comments under each particular criterion, um, please feel free to make that known. Uh, just to try, try not to interrupt anybody is, is all we ask. Hey, Tyler. And I do know that I'm going to take a, a, a very brief bathroom break. I will be back in a minute or two. Um, so, Jeremy, I had on the agenda that the commission was going to do a recess to discuss party status. Do we, should we do that? So I, I, I mean, we can, um, or for the sake of um, time, we can grant preliminary status uh, and then have a recess meeting between the commission and the coordinator later to decide final party status. That works for me. Yeah. And in our recess order, we we can match up the concerns with the criteria. Exactly. Correct. Yeah. OK, just so everyone knows how it works. Um, that's what we'll do. So this is. Pardon me, folks. May I break in for a minute? Yeah. So, so, so just one moment. Whoever that was. Um, so it's trying to identify. Trying to the portion. Hang on one second, sir. I just want to clarify something with Josh, and, and maybe this gets to your point. So, Josh, I'm I'm having a hard time tracking who's on the call. Do we know that nobody else is on the call that may be seeking parity status? My understanding is that the other individuals on the call are um, Tommy Gardner from the News and Citizen and Michael Reese or Rice, um, sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, from Greentown Access Television. They are non-party participants from a um, public information standpoint. We also have a few members of the Morristown Select Board on the call um, who are being represented by Tyler uh, and Dan Lindley. Uh, beyond that, I think that covers everybody that is participating. Okay, so thank you. Uh, I believe I cut somebody off, uh, 696-2650. Um, give you an opportunity to uh, interject now. And, and a reminder, Reminder for those folks joining um, by phone only. If you could, every time you speak, please state your name so we so we can keep things orderly and know, and we know who's talking. My apologies, it's Tommy Gardner over at the News and Citizen, uh, as you just mentioned. Uh, I just want to. I, I wasn't sure we're. Uh, you know, we we received a notice late of the meeting, and uh, we just want to make sure that. Uh, Aside from being a, a property, a, a budding property owner, party status that as the newspaper of record for the for the uh, community that we would also be apprised of any um, any uh, um, any documents or any, any anything that that the parties would get. Yep. Okay. So I, I have just made a note to make sure that I add you to the certificate of service uh, on a for your information only basis. So now you will receive all notifications uh, moving forward. Thank you, and I'll, I'll mute myself. So this is Matt Krause. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I just briefly wanted to touch base on party status, and I, I, I think I would concur that it would be better off if we uh, uh, allow temporary uh, 
uh, preliminary and, dis and then discuss them as a commission after the meeting or before the next uh, action that we take just for the time and takes and the um, the organization etc so that's my I think I'd, I'd prefer to go that way thank you Matt so um, with that, I think the commissioners have some initial concerns that we would uh, like to dive into a little bit now. And um, as we've identified some of the party status requests, um, we'll allow others to um, ask questions at that point as well as we go through the criteria. So um, I think our first pieces and I'm looking at our initial thing. Jocelyn, do you want to um, touch on uh, a criterion one that you had outstanding based on our um, initial review? Um, sure, and then I think we should circle back to, we, we just had a couple of project description questions, um, but I could start with one if you want to get those questions collected. They're, um, we in our outline in purple under general thoughts <laughs> questions. Um, so I'll start with air pollution focusing on noise. Uh, since 2004, uh, the world has changed in Vermont for noise and for gravel pits in Vermont, there's now a, a precedent that our district applies to all uh, gravel pit applications, and I did not see any analysis in the application. Um, and I think we definitely need that. Um, I would suggest uh, that the applicant reviews um, the noise. I don't want to call it a standard. The environmental court says it's not a standard, but it explains that this is the expectation. Um, and just to give you a little sense, it's a benchmark known as the Barry Granite Standard for, for measuring whether noise is adverse. It's actually under the aesthetic criteria eight, but it there's obviously a relationship to air pollution. And it's 70 decibels DBA LMAX at the property line of a project and 55 DBA LMAX outside an area of frequent human use. And so if you look at um, the Barry Granite standard, I think that's our expectation here. And um, there are various noise producing equipment being used here, uh, the crusher, the screener, um, and the trucks. Um, and I, I think, and I, I, I think to comply with the Barry Granite standard, there needs to be a noise analysis of, of those components. Um, and I only saw a reference to a noise study for a backup beeper, but I didn't see a noise study that demonstrated that the project complied with the Barry Granite standard. So Tyler, do you I want to, speak to that. Jeremy, was that you? Yes, it was. Do Do you uh, want to? Uh, yeah, well, we address? can uh, certainly take that into uh, consideration. We appreciate the input and uh, can look into that further. Okay. okay. Thank you. And uh, so, so Jocelyn, just point of clarification, the, the purple was me. And actually, that was a misunderstanding that Mr. Avery uh, clarified for me that there are five phases within phase three. Um, so, Mr. Avery, thank you for clarifying that for me. Yes. Um, but, but I did um, see uh, one of your notes uh, regarding tree and vegetation removal. Yes. And one of my questions was, um, so Tyler had said earlier tonight that no trees will be removed, but then he said there's clearing for the new road. So I'm trying to understand, will trees be removed at all? Um, I didn't see a clearing plan identified on the site plan in terms of 
acres of trees removed or brush or vegetation. So um, could you just speak to that and then we can the commission can chew on that to see if we need more specifics, but I'm a little unclear on what's going on there. Certainly, this is Tyler. Um, so we do identify on sheet two that in the area of the proposed uh, hall road that goes through old phase one into the new proposed phase three, uh, that there is an area of, of existing uh, vegetation and wooded areas that would need to be cleared in order to facilitate that new hall road going into phase three. When you say vegetation, are those trees or is it brush yeah, and shrub? Vegetation and wooded areas, wooded areas, including trees. Okay. Um, I don't have the plan pulled up here, but do you know if the plan specifies how many trees you're removing? No, it does not give a specific tree count. Okay. Um, one issue that I'll just flag for Jen Mojo from ANR. Um, I know that in for projects that are removing trees, um, bat issues have come up, and I don't know if that's been on your radar screen, but um, that comes up when you're removing trees. So I'll just point that out. Jocelyn, okay. I'll run that question by uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Jeremy, do you want me to continue with some other questions that slash issues under air pollution? Yeah, my thought is if we could we could do our thing with Criterion One and then um, turn it over. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, so one of the questions I had about the crusher is the crusher is. My understanding is that when the new phase starts, phase two, it, the, the new phase does not start until phase two is completed. Is that correct in my understanding? There's no overlap? Correct. Okay. So the crusher moves to the new phase three area. And for crushers in more recent Act 250 permits, there's been analyses on the kind of dust that migrates off the site. And oftentimes Act 250 commissioners don't get too involved in that because there's an air pollution permit needed, but there's no air pollution permit needed here. But at the same time, the commission needs to ensure the extent to which the dust from the crusher is migrating off the site. So just wanted to get a better sense of what was going on there and, and, and if ANR is looking into that at all. Um, and then we we will be looking into the operation hours, just looking at them from the perspective of um, are, are you was it your explanation before that there's zero increase in the truck traffic that will occur in phase three? Uh, the, the application and the testimony is that we are not requesting any increase in the allowable traffic to like to and from the pit. So okay. there's a max of trips per day and we are proposing to stay within that limitation. All right, Jeremy, that's those are my notes on air pollution. I don't know if you want to. Uh move on or how you want to handle that um so initially i thought to to the extent we have time we could give at least mr crandall time to discuss his concerns with um criterion one which i, I guess we can use use it as noise or we can wait till eight eight um any any objections to that Jeremy, do you mean in addition to what he described to the commission earlier? Yeah, if he wanted to offer okay. any any specific testimony regarding that.
so hearing none, uh, Mr. Crandall, if you want to um, offer some testimony related to noise um, for phase three. Sure, um, I can elaborate a little bit on what I spoke on earlier, um, and it's really simply to the fact that we were surprised to read that the, the, the town didn't think we could hear it from our homes. and. That's simply not the case. Um, and so I don't think the board Act 250 should should operate under the assumption that it's not audible from our homes. I didn't see any evidence that testing had been audible testing had had taken place um, within our community, though it's possible that I missed that. So um, we are concerned that the new pit will be elevated again and that will be more audible to us at our homes. Um, and that the, I think the crusher was listed as only taking place um, for a number of weeks within the summer, but it seems to be the loudest operation that takes place and it happens all day constantly. And it, it is a serious impact for our quality of life, um, given the mission statement of the community and the, given the mission statement of the community, I'll leave it at that. Um, so we are concerned with both the noise level of, of the of all operations, especially the crusher, um, and how that will change as the pit moves in elevation. Uh, did you want me to speak uh, about water supply? Is that also part of criterion one that you wanted me to chat about right now? No, I think we're just looking at uh, noise for criterion one. Um, I'm just looking at my notes a little more closely to make sure I'm not missing anything. I think that that would be sufficient at this time. OK, thank you. So this is Matt, <clears throat> Matt Kraus. And I, I did have a, a question maybe for the applicant. Uh, there was a comment about noise from the trucks, but it wasn't that there was universal and consistent. It seemed to be variable that one truck or uh, maybe a couple of trucks the noise level was significantly higher than the noise level of many of the other trucks. So I wonder if that could just be addressed quickly about why there might be some a significant difference in noise uh, with the same kind of trucks that are running through. Uh, this is Don Avery here. I, I brought that up. Are you asking me to clarify that or asking Tyler? I my this is Matt Krause again. My yeah. intention was to ask the applicant just to, okay. yep. to just to comment on that or be prepared to to provide some information. This is Tyler. Uh, can you give me just five seconds? Sure. <laughs> as much time as you like. Um, hey, Jeremy, while we're in this pause, I'm going to need to step away at 627 to sing happy birthday to my cousin who turned 40, and then I will be back three minutes later. But we're doing a group 627 happy birthday song. <laughs> okay. Thanks. It's, the, it's the important things right now, right? <laughs> Understood. This is Matt Krause again, and maybe Mr. Avery could comment again, just very briefly. He was the one who brought it up. I think that, you know, there is some significant noise differences uh, regarding the different trucks. So yes, I just um, want some. I, I I would say there there are two there are basically two types of trucks. One are the seven yard trucks and the fourteen yard trucks, where they are referred to single axle or tandem axle. And um, the, the, there's a little difference in motors, but for the most part, it's a, simply really a question of the, of the amount of um, maintenance that's been done or lack of maintenance that's been done on the beds and the tailgates and things, and they smack, smack up and down. And some trucks go past my house, which is about 80 feet from the road, and you don't even know they go by. It's just like a car going 20 miles an hour. And some of them, we, we hear them down the road. I, it's, it's hundreds and hundreds of yards away, and they're banging and banging and banging. And that's the, that's the real, 
the real problem is the banging. And I'm not 100% sure what that is, whether it's the tailgates or the beds or there's something else that's loose. But that's the issue, as, I've, as far as I've been able to understand it, all these years trying to figure it out. Hello, this is Tyler. Uh, I, just, I would say that uh, we'd like to take this, um, note this comment from Mr. Avery and uh, Matt that you're uh, interested in the matter more. I think we should just have some time uh, with the applicant here to discuss a little bit more, maybe look into a little bit more so we can have a, a better answer and response. Um, this is Matt Krause again. I'm fine with that. I just, that's fine. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tyler. Um, with that, are there any outstanding issues in Criterion 1 um, that the parties would like to bring up? Hearing none, we will go to Criterion 2 and 3. And uh, Tyler, I think you briefly touched on this on your in your overview. And certainly, I think maybe Mr. Avery has has an interest in uh, his spring as well as uh, the homeowners association, property owners association. So, um, could you dive into that a little bit deeper, and then we can turn it over to the other uh, parties? Uh, certainly. So, as I mentioned, um, we performed analysis of the proposed pit area and the existing Avery well. Um, we looked at this both from a surface water influence standpoint and from a confined aquifer influence standpoint uh, and a confined aquifer influence standpoint uh, with regard to potential contamination and risk and impact, so both from a quality and quantity standpoint. Uh, from a surface standpoint, uh, the limits of the pit are outside of both the previously designated buffer area of the well and also outside of the surface area as defined by the state of Vermont uh, drinking water rules for isolation shields. Uh, so we feel confident that from a surface superficial standpoint, uh, from quality or contamination are such that there would be no no effect there. Um, also, if you way look at the way that land flows, um, the well is located below, you know, downhill of the proposed pit area. However, given the lay of the land and the, and the various trenches and streams and uh, ditch and contours of the land, um, it seems unlikely that there would be contamination from surface waters. Tyler, I Tyler, this is Jocelyn Wilchuk. I just want to make sure I'm understanding the language you're using and the language Mr. Avery's using. It seemed like one concern of Mr. Avery was a recharge issue. And I didn't did you do a recharge analysis or you was your analysis focused more on contamination? Uh, as I mentioned, we were also looking at uh if you want to call it recharge, but basically looking at quantity impacts of, of subsurface groundwater impacts as well. Okay, so the exhibit you gave us uses the words as quantity and he's using recharge, but from your perspective, you looked at what he is identifying as a concern in that exhibit you provided us? I believe so. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so, so point, Tyler, along the so, sorry about that. Along those lines, you have um, a couple citations within um, your report um, where you cite various offsets, both vertically and horizontally. Where where did those come from? Are those uh, state um, best practices or, or guidance, or is that engineering discretion? Just trying to understand the context for those uh, limits. Well, I mean, we we did an analysis, a vertical, uh, basically a cross-section analysis and a site site analysis, and the, the site plan sketch that we provided shows those distances, both vertical and horizontal. So those are those are referenced in the report. Um, the isolation shields that I discussed are based on state standards for drinking water. Is there any dispute that? 
the meadow where phase three will occur is the recharge area for the Avery well? Yeah, I believe so, because what we're basically saying is that there is no groundwater aquifer area identified within the majority of the gravel pit area. I mean, there's there's certainly some surface water that infiltrates over time, but the primary flow of surface or groundwater is at a pretty low depth in this gravel pit area uh, above ground of the spring itself. So, so where, so it's, so I just want to understand the different thoughts here. So the applicant believes that the meadow area that's um, part of phase three is not the recharge area for the Avery well. Correct. And does the applicant have any sense where the recharge area is for the Avery well? Again, I go back to studying the borings and identified uh, what appear to be the, the identified groundwater locations and depths that are well below the depth of the proposed pit excavation. Groundwater flow uh, um, all the above areas above elevation wise above the spring extend you know well beyond uphill and inclusive of the whole watershed area in and around and above the, the gravel pit area itself. So I don't want to belabor this point. I'm just trying to think through if we need more information. So does the applicant know specifically where the recharge area is for the Avery well? Um, I don't think that we presented the extent or entirety of the recharge area. Okay, thank you. And just one quick follow up there. I'm just sorry. one second, Mr. Avery. Yeah, yeah. So, so one, one quick follow up there, Tyler. This is Jeremy Reed. And, and so, if, if I heard you correctly, uh, uh, the surface water did not likely contribute to contribute to the recharge of the Avery well from the meadow. So so aside from the groundwater, there's no surface water recharge either, correct? For in in your opinion. I mean, are you are you looking for an absolute statement? No, just engineering opinion basically that that the reduction in in surface water at that location, right? Cuz the gradient's changing, um, isn't c contributing to his um, recharge basically. Yeah, I guess I, I guess I, you know, to back up to the original question as far as the, the terminology here, um, the word recharge is getting said a lot. The word recharge is not something that we are, are in our analysis. And I think that the, the consideration of, of where recharge is, what it includes, what is specifically the recharge area and the, the source of recharge um, is not the point of the analysis. The point of the analysis was the potential impact itself on both the quality and quantity of the spring well. So I, I cannot say with definitive answers how, what the recharge area is and what it is specifically with this area. And I think that's a potentially maybe a further analysis uh, or a larger analysis. We stand by the analysis that we did and also the, the Ross environmental analysis regarding the potential impacts of this pit. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm getting a little too specific on what these different types of analysis are, but I, I certainly don't want to go on the record of, of making a statement about this recharge area when that really wasn't the point of the analysis. This is Commissioner Jocelyn Wilczek. What I'm trying to get my head around is there's a standard the applicant needs to meet under water supply. And how does the applicant know it can satisfy that standard if it doesn't know the sources of water for the Avery well? And if I've missed, if I've used wrong terms in there, or if I'm not understanding hydrology in that question um let me know but that's what i'm struggling with here is we have a dispute we have a landowner saying this meadow is where my water comes from for my well 
and then I believe the applicant saying no, that's not true. OK. But how does the applicant know it's not affecting water supply if it doesn't know where the water's coming from for the well? I think we go back to, you know, what what the concern is, uh, and the concern was potential impacts to the well. So that well, you know, as we, you know, as we stated, we we don't know every detail about that well. So uh, if if the statement is that we can't come to a conclusion without knowing that total and all detail of everything around and, and influencing that well from the entire standpoint. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a maybe there's a point there, but the analysis was based on that spring wells like this spring well are typically supplied and and provided for by groundwater. It's typically, a local influence of surface water. So the point is is that this spring is getting mainly supplied by groundwater, and that the proposed pit is not affecting the uphill groundwater and that the spring may be affected by local surface waters and that the gravel pit area is not affecting those local surface waters. Okay, so ju just to wrap this up, this has been really helpful. Has Mr. Avery shared his experts report or analyses with you? He has not. And Mr. Avery, is that something that you anticipate doing? Is your expert going to write up some kind of report so you could share that information with with the the town? Oh, absolutely. What what we've been waiting for uh, was for the the uh, ANR and and specifically, I think Scott Stewart and Marjorie Gale to review this under criteria 9E. Because when we when we look at the plans, and I, I don't want to edge over into testimony, and I'm not able to give expert testimony, but when we read the plans, I mean, it's clear to us, and I, I, I don't, if you look at, at the, uh, let me see, the, first of all, in, in the plans, they do not give, they, they, they left out the water table data. It's referred to in Mr. Mumley's report, but it's, I can see no place where it's actually included in the application. I happen to have a copy of that, which I got from the town a couple of years ago. But if you look on sheet C2, um, I don't, the one I'm looking at, the most current one, does not even include the locations of the borings, where they, and they discovered water in roughly half of the borings. And they don't even show that on the plan that I have in front of me, the most recent plan. But when we did the math on that, the, you have a, one of the borings on phase five, it was at 470 feet elevation, and um, uh, they found water. Water was detected at 43 feet below the surface, so that's 697 feet elevation. And Mr. Monley's plan is, to de is the pit floor shows it itself at 690, so he's seven feet underwater. So, uh, there's so much, so much wrong with their with their analysis that we were waiting for for the real comments to come through from the state geologist and the state hydrogeologist, and um, Jennifer didn't really go into the depth of that. But they've requested um, a number of things, and one thing they want is 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 more extensive groundwater wells. I'm not sure if they were monitoring wells or just test wells to find out where that water table is because the applicant has not met any remotely met any burden of proof to really as you're getting to to show us what's really going on up there so we've been just waiting for things to come together because it's been so chaotic and so we we would have re, haven't been offering our expert expert opinion because we don't want to we want to wait until things sort of settle down is because of the, the ANR the ANR are commenting on that and making more sense out of it because it's just totally chaotic and if you read the two reports they've offered two two reports there's the the Ross one and the Mumley report they're totally contradictory so it, we have two moving targets so. I guess I should maybe just leave it there, but I think your concerns are very well grounded and your questions are excellent. And those are the same questions we have. Well, well just- The hydrogeologist has, has performed a couple of, of, of analysis uh, to try to determine from different points of view where the aquifer is. And he's concluded absolutely that the aquifer is, is a, a, at least a good portion of it is, is, is underneath the proposed uh, extraction. 
Well, well, just just one idea here is information sharing. Yeah. Um, when you get it um, to the extent that the town and you all can share information in ANR, and uh, ultimately for us, we have one report from the applicant. But it, if you can't work this out, we would. I I, I know I don't I don't know about Mountain Jeremy, but. Um, having something from someone else in writing so we can understand discreetly what the issues are would be helpful if you can't if you can't all work it out when the hearing when it comes time for a hearing um yeah jocelyn um, this is jeremy I, I totally agree and and jen i don't know if you can weigh in on this as far as what a and r's concerns were and what their suggested course of action may be Sure, this is Jen Mojo from ANR. I didn't want to get too much into detail just because it's a pre-hearing and we haven't fully completed our analysis of um, the project. I can provide some overview of the types of information that we're asking for and, and why. Um, under um, criteria 90, 90, but also with two and three water supply, um, we have the groundwater protection rule and strategy, as well as the Vermont Geological Society practice for sand and gravel pits. Um, and there's a number of pieces of information within what I'll call the practice for 9D and 9E that um, the uh, geological survey requests as part of the application. One is um, a demonstration that project activities will remain three feet above the groundwater table. So. One of the pieces of information that we ask for are additional borings near um, what I'll call phase 3-5, the area that the Avery's are concerned about um, to demonstrate the, the distance between the groundwater table and the extraction activities. We also ask for um, additional cross sections, which show the, the um, groundwater level throughout the pit and because we know that boring information typically contains um, a, a reading of where the groundwater table is at that time the boring is taken so th that's the pieces of types of pieces of information that um, we're asking for and sort of the context why um, let me see what great else. that was helpful Okay, yeah, and I, I, you know, we're also asking for additional information about uh, fueling and maintenance activities and where those will take place because we do know that um, those are potential sources of contamination and we want to ensure that those activities take place in an area that um, there's sufficient overburden to um, protect the groundwater source. Um, so that's another piece of information that we've requested. Great, thank you. So, um, Tyler, I don't know that you're prepared to to speak to this, but I think the Lamore Valley property owners also had some some water supply concerns. Have has the applicant considered those concerns uh, to date? Uh, this is Tyler. Uh, just to back up. Um, Regarding Don Avery's well, you know, we're, uh, I've heard those comments from Jen, and we're more than happy to work with NR uh, through those items, and we will do so. Also, happy to work with Mr. Avery uh, if he has specific information to share. Uh, regarding the, uh, the 10 bends, folks, um, as stated in the existing permit uh, for phase two. Hydrogeologist, um, Mr. Hopper, who actually Mr. Avery is using currently, uh, performed a, an analysis and, and it was determined that there would be no impacts to their water sources. And so we're not aware of any impacts that have occurred. Um, and so we don't believe there are going to be any impacts uh, from this phase three, which will be located further away to the south um, than from those locations. So at this point, uh, we didn't have any additional proposed analysis or, or um, items proposed. 
OK, understood. Matt, do you want to add anything to Criterion 2? I uh, <clears throat> this is Matt Krauss. I I do have some items that I want to just uh, bring up, maybe for discussion or at least preparation for in a hearing. But um, I'm not sure that they fit under two. I think they're probably going to be under eight. So uh, why don't I? I'm fine with right, I'm fine right now. Let's put it that way. Okay. Um. Just because I think it does fit into two, uh, one of the parties is asking uh, via the chat if uh, the town cleaning out drainage ditches and retention ponds around the village, if that material can be deposited at this pit. And is there any discussion about uh, hydrocarbons that may be present in that those that waste, basically? Um, can, can the applicant speak to using this as either a storage facility or ultimate waste site for um, those sort of activities? Uh, so the town does, does not take uh, off-site materials from maintenance of Ditches and streams and such, and and bring it to the site. Okay, was thank you. The, was that yeah? Was that the extent of the question? I, I believe so. Uh, Mr. Donahoe, would you like to expand upon that? Did that satisfy your question? Yeah, I just wanted to make just clarify that if they were. Dumping any material not native to the area to the travel pit. So that would make it a whole different application. And it okay. sounds like the town is never going to bring anything into that gravel pit. They're just going to take it out. That is the testimony. Yep. That's that satisfied my question. Thank you. Uh, for the purposes of, of wrapping up criterion two and three, do any other parties have any concerns regarding uh, water supply issues? Under criteria three, I have, a, a, I think, a procedural comment. This is okay. Uh, speaking. Yep. OK, thank you. Yep. Um, in the in the permit, uh, original permit that was issued in 1991, there was specific language uh, giving protection to our spring under, I think it was under criteria E. Um, and uh, it, out, it, out, it outlined a, a zone up in there, a, a part of the land that was protect, was not to be, uh, uh, to be left in a natural condition specifically to protect the spring. And um, uh, we've always relied on that as, as uh, sort of the backbone protection for the spring. Uh, and now that the excavation is coming on there, they're proposing to excavate right on that's right into that zone that, that has that's uh, subject to that permit condition from 1991. And it seems to me in reading board rule 34 E uh, that I, I would, I would certainly expect the commission to, um, to apply uh, that uh, Stoke club Highlands analysis to that permit condition. Um, we, we also, I also would like to have a chance to um, submit um uh, potentially my, my interpretation of how that uh, should be analyzed. Um, Thank uh, you for bringing that to our attention. Do you have the particular permit condition um, in mind? Which Yes, uh, it's uh, the original permit under criteria 90 conclusions on page 32, bottom of 32 and the top of 33. And I can, there's one sentence I can read to you, but it probably wouldn't make sense unless you look at the, uh, you, you have to become pretty familiar with the site plan to be able to interpret it. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to take a look at that um, at, at a later date, but thank you for bringing that to our attention because that is a rule that if there's a conflict between a previous condition and a proposed project, um, the Stowe Club Highlands analysis comes into play. 
Thank you. This is Tyler Mumley. Uh, the buffer area is shown on the plans and the limits of the project uh, do not go into that buffer area. May I comment on that? Um, he, he's just this not is, referring to what I, we're not referring to the same oh. thing. He, they're unaware of what I'm of what I'm speaking of. They have not addressed that in the application, and they're unaware of it t entirely, as far as I can tell. Okay, Mr. Avery, I think I think we'll go back and look at the previous permit conditions, uh, and if warranted, we'll we'll definitely go to Skull Highlands. And and just for the applicant's sake. If we ask for a Stowe Club Highlands analysis, the first question for the applicant is whether there is a conflict. And so if, in fact, there's a disagreement about location, you the applicant can point that out in the analysis. Yeah, if we're, if, if, if we're unaware of, of something, uh, certainly want to be made aware of it. We feel that we are aware of all previous permits. Uh, requirements and rules and feel that we've adhered to them. Um, if there has been an error or an issue, then we are more than happy to uh, to work to, to resolve that, whatever it may be. Right. And, and Mr. Avery, to the extent you're comfortable um, in giving that information to the town, uh, that's really helpful to our process also. Are you referring now to, to the permit condition from way back in 91 at this moment or or? Oh. Um, no, I, I was referring to what seems to be um, a discrepancy or a misunderstanding in terms of you're identifying an area that the applicant is not aware of. So if there could be a connection there, that I think would be helpful for the process to... Um, I, I think, I'm sorry to interrupt, I think if you're just referring to the, the, the permit condition, from from 1991, it's in the permit on page 32 and 33. It's it's not an area that I have any any special privy to. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes, no, that's helpful. So so now the it's, it's just a plainly written permit condition. Okay. Yeah. And it it identifies the area you're talking about. It it identifies it. Yep. Exactly. Okay. So now Tyler, it, he I don't know if you heard it, but it was the top of uh, page 30. The bottom of page 32, the top of page 33 in the 1991 permit. Um, and the permit or the findings of fact? It's, it's all wrapped up in one, page 32 and 33. I had one, I had one last question on this. Um, in the application it it mentions or at least how i interpreted it the applicant was relying on a wooded buffer area to shield the avery spring so is the town committing to not remove any trees or vegetation in that buffer area that they identify this is tyler uh it, it was that previous permits had uh, Put into place that a wooded buffer shall be maintained, uh, which is related to the spring and related to the protection of the spring, and that we are adhering adhering to that to that buffer. Thank you. Moving on to Criterion Five, uh, Jocelyn did the earlier um, clarification with the number of trips uh, satisfy your concern? I'm I'm just a little confused and it could be that I did not read something and I can get through this quickly. So the 1992 permit authorized 120 single trips. The way I read the 2004 permit, it authorized 80 daily trips and required that only trucks owned by the town could be used. And then Tyler explained that nothing is going to change from the 2004 permit but the way i read the application was that i thought you were requesting 200 one-way daily truck trips and to contract out the hauling so i saw that as two changes but 
could you explain if I'm reading something wrong? What what is so maybe we could take it two ways. Are your daily truck, truck to, trips going to be 80 daily trips as allowed under the 2004 permit? And is the town sticking to the 2004 permit condition of the town has to own all the trucks? The answer is yes to both of those. And if there's, um, if, if the application wasn't clear on that, then it, it, then it needs to be. Yeah, because in the application, there's a discussion that the town now wants to contract out the hauling. And that was an issue in the previous permit. So you're saying the town is not contracting out the hauling, that all the trucks will still be owned by the town? Correct. Uh, in the application, I mentioned that the town would like to purchase additional 14 yard trucks. Um, but I, I certainly did not, we did not mean to infer or state that anything would be contracted out. The, the, the very concrete proposal here is that it would only be town trucks performing operations. Thank that, you. Yeah, and that the, the number of trips would not increase. From so were the... So where the application says 200 one-way daily truck trips, that's an error and it's just 80 daily trips like the 2004 permit? Is that 80 round trip or 80? What does it mean 80 daily trips? Is that one-way round trip, 160 daily trips, or is it 80 round trip? Uh, well, I apologize. For the, uh, I don't. I apologize. It says it says 200 one-way trips. Again, it should be limited to 80, and that should be it should be round trips, wouldn't it? 81-way. Yeah, that'd be 80, 80 round trip. That's what I thought. Okay. Thank you very much. Matt, do you have any any other discussions on Criterion 5? Uh, no, I don't, but I just... <clears throat> in, it, it's either in this one or the next one. I, I just wanted to make sure I was clear about the culvert. So was ANR going to take a look at the culvert or the culvert issue with the applicant going to be taking a look at the culvert issue. So I'm not sure if that's under five or uh, maybe on one of the other ones, uh, 9K, but who's the, for that culvert, there's some, the, um, someone raised an issue regarding the culvert. So who's going to be pursuing that or is the applicant going to be doing that or is ANR going to be doing it? Mr. Tyler, um, so the, the there's kind of there's kind of two things at, at play there, um, and none of this has to do with the actual uh, proposed phase three pit area. Uh, what what came to pass was during the application process for the multi sector general permit with the state stormwater department, uh, we identified that there were three outfall locations off the town property and they're located along the existing paved hall route starting at uh, the entrance into the into the property on Duhamel Road, another one about halfway up and another one a little further up. So the culvert in question exists at the very beginning of the entrance into the property, whereas half of the half of the culvert appears to exist within the property on the south side of the road and the other half of the pipe appears to exist um, off the property uh, based on the north side of the road. Uh, the majority of the pipe, regardless of that, is, is, is contained within the right-of-way of the road. However, a small portion sticks out past the right-of-way onto Mr. Avery's property outside the right-of-way. So this, this pipe uh, location, the outfall, which is 
on Mr. Avery's property is, is identified as a sampling point for the multi-sector general permit uh, uh, conditions for sampling and testing after rainfall events as such for turbidity and, and other things. So uh, that, that's one point, and, and we're working through that whole permit process. The state stormwater has issued a draft permit. Uh, it's under comment period right now. We've discussed this with Mr. Avery. Uh, latest discussion I've had with the state on this, on this point is that uh, we could actually use uh, the inlet of the pipe as a sampling point. Uh, and if we could do that, then it, it, may, it may put to bed uh, the issue of the outfall of the pipe being on Mr. Avery's property as a, as a sampling point. So that, that's still something we're trying to work through with the state uh, and, and would like to involve Mr. Avery as well. The other issue is the stream itself. Uh, we've seen and identified by Mr. Avery, as you discussed, that a portion of the stream upstream of the upset culvert is um, having issues and, and causing some flooding. Uh, and the town is more than happy to work with Mr. Avery to, to try to remedy that, remedy that problem. This is, oh, Good. Jen this Mojo is from a and R. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. Go ahead. I, I would just add to what Tyler said. Um, this is probably one of the areas where the agency would like to perform a site visit. Um, Mr. Avery had mentioned issues regarding flooding and um, my sense is that a site visit with folks from our stormwater rivers and fisheries programs would be able to help troubleshoot some of the flooding issues. And um, we had also discussed with Tyler setting up a site visit to view the streams on the ground. As he mentioned, there's a couple of streams on the property that are not identified on the ANR Atlas, but we would like to see those on future site plans. Great, this thanks. Is Matt Krause. Yeah. Oh, this sorry, Matt, Matt. go ahead. This is Matt Krause. I'm fine. That's as long as it's going to be um, addressed and they're doing some additional testing, I'm comfortable with that right now. Thank you. Are there any other concerns related to transportation at this time? Jeremy, I'd like to jump in real quick. This is Josh. Sure, or Josh. Yep. So we've reached the, the 630, um, you know, what was noticed was a pre hearing conference from 430 to 630 that was publicly noticed. Um, but if all are, are in agreement and willing to continue on, um, rather than reconvene a part two of this hearing. Um, that's, that is what um, I'm, I am proposing now. Um, but if any of the commissioners or participants in the, in the pre-hearing conference have other obligations or are no longer able to participate, um, we may, may need to reconvene for a, a part two. So um, I just wanted to jump in and let everyone know that this time frame is what was publicly noticed. Um, so to, to carry on, uh, I would like consensus um, in order to do so. Uh, the applicant's okay with continuing. Any objections? Okay, Jeremy, yeah. continue on. Thank okay, you, everybody. Thanks, Josh. So I didn't hear any any further objections with Criterion 5. So um, Criterion 8, uh, Jocelyn, do you want to get into the Barry Corey uh, Criterion? And um, I mean, I think you described that pretty well. I don't know if you have anything to add to it, but maybe Tyler, I don't think you have anything to add to it by the look. So Tyler, do you um, want to respond to that or, or commit to doing um, more testing? I guess I'm missing what what the what what is the request? Um, this is jo uh, Commissioner Jocelyn Wilczek. I had articulated earlier um, the Barry Granite standard that granite operations need to comply with regarding noise, and it's noise from all sound materially sound producing equipment, um, the crusher backup alarm system, screen, the screener, and I didn't see that in your application. Okay, I guess I'll just confuse. I, I thought we had already discussed that 
and agreed that we would look into that further. Yeah, yeah, I agree. That's why I had nothing to to add there. I think we're all set there. Jeremy had a I don't, further request. Oh, okay, fair enough. Yeah, yeah. I, I just don't want to skip over it without giving everybody. Okay. Uh, this is, I think. Sorry, Matt. Go ahead. This is Matt Krause. I just uh, under uh, criteria eight. Um, several individuals mentioned uh, safety, and uh, I think one in particular was signage. So where it was uh, so the trails that were uh, on the property weren't uh, maybe uh, the, the best marked. Uh, they. Uh, and that there were some safety issues, and I, I, I just wondered if it's uh, um, if that's something that uh, the applicant wanted to comment on, or that uh, would that be a subject possibly for uh, the hearing? You know, if we do a site visit, then it's one thing that, that, that all three commissioners can see what the signage looks like and berms, et cetera. Um, but it's been raised, and I. I think under criteria eight, it might be worth uh, hearing from the applicant. Um, Josh, this is uh, Jocelyn Wilczek. I have a question. Some of the adjoining landowners raised the safety issues that Matt just articulated. And where, what is the criterion for public health and safety? Because that's where these issues are coming into. Um, and I'm having trouble finding which criterion that is right now on my small screen. Yeah, so I would agree that I'm not, you know, entirely certain at this very moment um, under which criteria that best falls. Um, I think it probably fits best under five. Um, as recreational, the, the safety issues are to recreational users, you know, transportation users of the property, whether it's biking or walking, hiking. Yeah. Um, so I think that makes the most sense, but that's something we, you know we can talk uh, about. Okay. Iron out in the post um, conference report, but I think five makes the most sense. Right, because I think Matt, I agree with you. I think that is a something that we'll need to look into more about demarcating the boundary lines. And it's broader than what does the sign look like? It's where will the signs be and all that stuff. So that's great that you brought that up. So Josh, we'll, we'll put that in five under pedestrian traffic issues, right? Okay. Sounds good. Five. And I'm assuming at that time, and, and I don't know, I think we've still got to create an excess, but uh, recreation spilling over on your private property and, and the, the potential of this project bringing more recreation to the site. I'm a little confused on that issue from the landowners, the adjoining landowners perspective. And maybe it's because I haven't been to the site, but I'm having trouble understanding how a gravel pit has recreation on it. And I'm thinking that's because it's this huge site and portions of it are clearly for recreation. But why would phase three bring more recreation or your or the adjoining landowners concern that there's, I guess I'm just totally confused about the recreation and the adjoining landowners concerns about that from so, i think i might have a help on that this is steven donahoe what's going to happen is if you look on some of the maps they have in their permit they show the existing trails so they're basically going to cut those trails off so that's going to push more recreational people into our community via other ways okay that that i get about okay i have questions on that under 9k so we don't have to uh i don't need to ask them questions about the recreational trails now but thank you for that clarification because now that does make sense to me and can i just say something about safety i mean i'm surprised that 
to do an Act 250 permit, you don't have to address safety, the safe operation of a gravel pit. We can't we can't change the laws, but we we do. There are other legal um, there are other laws out there that we have no control over. But um, so to that extent, we are limited, but we do. We are able to focus on safety of pedestrians and human beings at, at the site. Um, for example, we can't regulate the safety of the workers on the site that's a you know an osha thing but right right the, the concerns you raise are within our area okay thank you mm -hmm. so with that um is is scott dylan still with us i think he addressed it but i think he i don't see him Okay. I don't believe he's still still there. I think he's here. I still here. Sorry. Okay. I was just <laughs> muted there with a headset that I had to click in. Oh, okay. So so Scott, did you I think you gave early indications that you were all set, but I, I want to give you an opportunity yeah, to we're all set. Speak. Um way back in uh last year in May and June, we uh we identified archaeologically sensitive areas and actually did a survey in June and came up with no findings. So um and that was really focused on essentially the eastern part of the phase three uh, extraction area where it's more level. A uh, good portion of the uh, phase three area is fairly hilly, but there is a level shelf on the eastern side, and that's what we looked at. But no more concerns. Okay, thank you, Scott. Do, Matt, do you have any other concerns on criteria eight before we turn it over to the other parties? No, I just Matt Krause. No, I, I don't. Okay. Uh, Mr. Crandall, can can you um, maybe get into a little bit more detail about some of the um, concerns that your group had with Criterion 8? Which criteria, which concerns that did I bring up that would match with Criterion 8? Was it the invasive species? Is that what you're talking about? Well, I, I guess I was looking at this, and, and Josh, you can correct me, but uh, I think you talked about the reclamation and creating uh, and preserving the natural areas. Um, and maybe because they're not rare, it should be under nine. Yeah, the, um, we're concerned that the, the gravel pit, as, as it moves from one site to another, um, really, we're concerned with, with the slope. Of the of the of the two to one slope that's mentioned uh, in the safety of that as as recreation begins to reclaim that area and how grasses if if grasses are the only um, vegetation being added to the slopes after leading to the next pit that 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 would leave the the area vulnerable to the spread of invasive species so if trees could be planted um, to create a more diversified um, habitat. That, that the that the spread of invasive species would be slowed um, or 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 stopped or abated completely. Um, invasive species are present there now currently. Japanese knotweed is is um, is a huge issue, and and we as a, a neighboring um, landowner would love to see that that. I know they address it in in their in their permit application. Um, uh, at least the forester did, I think. Um, that, that that is addressed um, with with wholehearted intent for it to be eliminated completely. Um, honeysuckle and Japanese knotweed we have seen there on that site as well as on our own. Um, we can't point fingers on how it got there, but it 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 makes sense that if it wasn't there to begin with before the this this project began in the what the late 70s, early 80s, that that it came in as a result of the actions of removing the gravel. So 
um, for our own interests in, in preserving our own natural environment here um, in Ten Bends, we would we would be very happy to see that that more um, intentional and honest efforts are made to to uh, abate those problems because they uh, will affect us. Can I jump in here, Jeremy? Um, yes, please, John. Can I, oh, sorry. So, so these concern the invasive species concerns fall under um, criteria nine K which I'm not going to cut off the discussion of that um, now that we're in it. Um, but I would, one follow-up question I would have is how specifically does the spread of invasive species on the gravel pit tract of land currently adversely impact you and other Ten Bends residents or potentially impact you in the future? Wait, can I can I just that that I just have a this is Commissioner Wilczek. I have a question for Jen Mojo from ANR. Um, I know that ANR requires non-native invasive species plans on a variety of projects when there's disturbed soil. Is is the agency looking at this project through that lens as well? Because kind of going to Josh's question, my understanding is that one of the agency's goals is to limit the spread of invasive species, regardless of whether it's going on to an adjoining tract of land to limit it. So, so Jen, could you speak to that and, and how do you apply that to this kind of project or require we, that here? Yeah, this is Jen Mojo from the Agency of Natural Resources. We haven't in the past typically required a, a non-native invasive species type of plan um, for gravel pit projects. They're typically requested um, for projects where there's restoration activities in sensitive areas, so stream buffers or wetlands. Um, I can look into that. I'm, I'm not obviously not prepared to speak to that today. Um, yeah, I was thinking I, the road area because I can obviously see, you know, a gravel pit, you're building a hole in the earth and um, an, an NNIS plan would be challenging there, but where you have a road, a new road going in, um, I didn't know if the agency kind of separates things into buckets, like a gravel pit is different than the new road or other disturbed land that doesn't fall within the excavated pit area. Yeah, let me look into that um, and I can, um, talk to some staff who are more familiar with um, development of those types of plans and when we ask for them. Um, okay. I'll okay. flag that, yep. Okay, and then um, I didn't mean to cut Josh off, but Josh's question prompted a question that if I didn't ask, I was gonna forget. So I think Josh's question was going to Nick about why do, why do the adjoining landowners care about the spread of invasive species or is that was because okay because to me it's pretty I, it's pretty clear to me why the spread of invasive species is a problem but I didn't know if there was is this spread going on to town forest property or is this a spread going on to private property maybe that's Paul Paul Keating uh, do you uh, want to share your thoughts on this hi this is Jennifer Kramer um, Jennifer, sorry. Hi. Um, let's let's think about this. The um, concerns that we have are at the edge of the gravel pit. There is significant honeysuckle that borders the Morrisville Town Forest, which has um, close border with a number of us private property owners and the and the, the Ten Bends uh, common land. Our um, Ten Bends common land is under current use and active forestry. And we are at great risk for the spread of honeysuckle into this forest asset. And I also question um, the issue of the Japanese knotweed. It is um, <clears throat> growing on huge mounds that appear to have been uh, brought in from uh, from maybe clearing out ditches or something. There are huge mounds, uh, very steep-sided, and a couple 
Japanese knotweed. It is not a natural occurrence. And what's happening, you can see it coming off of these mounds and it is moving up the hillside where you intend to build the road. And you were expressing concern about um, removing trees in that area. And that is precisely the interface of the knotweed and the trees. It, it is so dramatic what's happening with the knotweed. Whether it came in from overburden ditches or whether it is just trucks moving in and out with this on the um, their plows or what I, I can't say um, so we are at risk to having uh, to, to recap we're at risk to having not we uh, move into uh, the Marsville town forest um, fringe and our floodplains um, along the riparian areas and we're also at great risk for honeysuckle. It is mature honeysuckle that is just. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. This is Jeremy Reed. Um, a question for, for Jen Mojo, and, and I just wanna make sure I understand you correctly. The, the reclamation of the site and what I'm assuming would be some um, bringing in of, of topsoil and it's really, establishing vegetation that does not fall under a and r jurisdiction unless it's in a sensitive area um in that practice this is jen mojo from agency and natural resources in that practice that i had mentioned earlier the 99e practice for um standing gravel pits there are guidelines for applicants to use regarding how to revegetate sand and gravel pits it's typically use of a seed mix specific type of seed mix um and the overlap with the non-native invasive species usually occurs separately for discrete projects where um, we're looking for restoration, say, in a wetland buffer or a stream buffer. Um, but typically for the more larger extent of sand and gravel pits, it's restoration and reclamation using a, a seed mix of the applicant's choice. But there are specific ones identified in that um, practice. A lot of times sand and gravel pits are um, redeveloped as um, in different types of land uses. So the thought is that um, if, if you know there's redevelopment occurring there in a relatively short period of time, that what you're, what this practice is seeking to achieve is soil sta stabilization through um, revegetation using that seed mix. So it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily focus on non-native invasive species, it's more of a soil stabilization um, method. And, and there's not a specific criteria if you're bringing in topsoil to help establish that growth for stabilization purposes, that it be uh, free of non-native invasives and that there be some uh, implicit warranty to that, that if, if the occurrence did present itself, the applicant would be responsible? There's nothing specifically in that practice right now no i mean it, it's a good idea um but we we don't have any um guidance on that aspect currently okay great do any of the uh other parties wish to add anything to miss kramer's testimony um can i just say one more thing please if yeah, please. Um, if in the reclamation that they're um, talking about, they that they start um, sort of flattening these huge mounds that are up at the entrance and using that to create buffers, those mounds are covered with the Japanese knotweed. And if they start moving that around, there will there will really be a serious problem up there. Thank you. Well, I think that's a good segue into. Criteria 9D and 9E earth resources where reclamation issues uh, fall under that criterion. So I think the, the commissioners had had some questions uh, regarding 9D and 9E and 
I would like to ask the applicant um, if there are are you committing to reclaiming phase two? Presumably that is fully extracted at this point before you reach the five acre threshold. Um, if you're in fact done with that area, or or are you just basically balancing five acres of of disturbed area at a time? The answer is yes. So, so reclamation would start uh, immediately after your extraction was completed. Correct. There's Thank still some finish up work in phase two, but uh, it's not much longer. And once it's done, then it will be uh, reclamation activities will start immediately after it's done. Okay. Um, one question on 9E. So there's this 6,000 acre uh, or 6,000 yard special projects um, condition that's that's been carried forward, and and this uh, phase uh, seeks to extend that. Can you give us a little history because I think it, I think it was worded in one of the previous amendments that'll occur every two or three years for special projects. Can you give us a history as far as how often you've used that 6,000 yards? And and I'm just looking for an actual extraction rate. So are you actually extracting 31,000 yards a year or are you extracting uh, 25,000 yards a year? And once every four years, you'll go up to 31,000. Uh, do you have any, any uh, History to, to add to that? Um, actually, this is Dan Lindley, the, uh, the town administrator. It's actually pretty rare. Occasionally, what we do is we'll have some road projects or construction projects of our own um, that we will work on and we'll use fill from the, the pit for those types of construction projects. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, we did a project we called the A Street to B Street project, and we used some fill out of that from the pit to actually refill that area and bring some things up to grade. Um, so it's really pretty rare that we do it. So it's, it's probably every three years. I actually, we don't do it as much as we can because we're trying to take some of that burden off of our highway crew and let them do the maintenance things that we need to do. Uh, does that answer your question? It does. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Do uh, Jocelyn or Matt have any questions on 9D or 9E? No. This is Matt. I don't. I don't have any. Okay. Um, I I just have one last question on sort of reclamation. Can the applicant speak to when you uh, are going to uh, reclaim these projects? Are you introducing topsoil, non-native topsoil, or are you when you strip the overburden off? Is it stockpiled for uh, for that purpose? We're using on-site soils only, so we're, we're stripping the top layer and stockpiling it and re reusing it later for reclamation. Thank you. Do, you. do you inspect the topsoil in any way to ensure it does not have invasive species that you're then spreading over a larger site, a larger air surface area? How, how do you know, how does the town know it's not doing what um, one of the adjoining landowners thought was occurring, meaning you have a mound, it clearly has invasive species on it, and you're you're kind of spreading that out. Um, can you give us a little sense of what's what's happening there? Currently? Um, well, I mean, what's happening currently is that there are stockpiled areas around the existing pits that are still being used to push back that topsoil to reclamation. Um, I think some of the piles of area they're talking about may be some older piles. They may also have been some of the original sound barrier piles um, that have been there for a while. Um, up in this phase three proposed area, you know, we're not aware of any invasive species specifically in that meadow area, um, but this is certainly something that we can uh, give more attention to. Okay. Thanks.
Do any of the other parties want to add anything to um, extraction or earth resources at this time? Uh, Don Avery here. I, I don't really have anything to add, but I just want to make it clear that I only expressed my concern about the, the banging truck beds, but I'm concerned about you know, in, any any of the noise uh, that can be uh, put under under 90 or whatever criteria from, from anywhere on the project, including the crusher and that sort of stuff. I just don't want to narrow myself just down to the truck beds. Yeah. Understood. Thank you. Nick, could you restate um, your concerns regarding reclamation and slope, please? Well, I think it, it's a couple of different issues that come together here. Um, safety, uh, when for pedestrians visiting town property after the reclamation um, is, is complete, um, the safe slopes um, so that people aren't falling and hurting themselves. And and so that the, the the area itself is is reclaimed in a in a way that it returns to its natural status prior to the extraction of the gravel originally, um, and 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 I think that would go to uh, you know helping prevent the invasive species from further spreading. Those are the three you know concerns that we have about um, the return to what it was. Okay, um, quick follow-up question. In other gravel pits and rock quarries, um, conditions have been imposed, imposed requiring fence at the top of pits to prevent um, or granite blocks or some, some, something very obvious and very obstructive to prevent or at least create a separation between the edge of the pit. Is that a solution that would be um, workable for you from your perspective? You know, I'd be really interested to hear what Steven has to say. I don't think that anything crazy needs to happen. I just, we, we're just interested in it being safe and, and visually like um, aesthetically pleasing. Um, so I don't think any extra expense needs to be added to make it, you know, absurdly safe. But I do think that concern, uh, you know, attention needs to be given to how the borders of their property is 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 affects our entrance to it and exit from it um, when we go to and from. Steve, did you have any thoughts? Well, I think the safety part of the edge is more of a concern of the new gravel pit. Um, assuming when they reclaim the existing gravel pit, they're going to slope it and regrade it more into a natural, like you said, put it back into the natural state that it was before but currently the gravel pit is pretty steep drop and there's no safety barriers at the edge period so <clears throat> it seems like a liability to the town they should have at least a fence a small fence or a snow a snow fence of some sort of barrier that would prevent uh hikers or kids or cross-country skiers from going over the edge. That's my concern. Thank you. This is Tyler Mumley. Uh, one of the things we propose and one of the things that's happening in the pit is that uh, there's berm berm around the, the top edge of the pit. And it's something that we propose for phase three as well. Tyler, this is Jeremy. Did did you say that um, they are there now, and and you would propose that for um, phase three? So uh, essentially, you have installed some berms for phase two. Yeah, um, it's also part of the MSHA regulations that we adhere to. But uh, currently, in phase two, some of those areas are are done and reclaimed, and but some areas are still active. But in the active areas, there's a uh, berm that's maintained up on top, and that would be proposed also the same for phase three. If there's a berm there, it must have disappeared overnight because I haven't seen it. You can walk right up to the edge of the pit and look over. Well, I think when we have our site visit, these are some things that folks can point out to us and we could take a look at. That'd be great. Um, yeah. 
Right. Okay, I think we've touched on everything for 9D and 9E. Uh, Jocelyn, did you want to touch on 9K recreation trails? Yeah, I had a clarifying question, which will help us figure out if we have a, a concern we need to look into more. But the application says it plans to block recreation trails and permanently close some of them. And I'm trying to figure out why and why that doesn't run afoul of 9K public investments. Um, if you could just flesh that out for me a little bit, that may help, uh, th that'll help us. This is, this is Tyler. So there, there's currently some recreational trails that run through the uh, proposed phase three area. And so the proposal is that um, those recreational trails cannot continue to go through the gravel extraction area. So they would need to be um, closed and, and not used um, because of the gravel operations uh, for safety reasons. And so those those trails would need to be um, ended and cut off and, and no longer used because that's where the gravel extraction operations would be happening. So, so let me ask you this so I can kind of get a sense of what's covered. In the um, 1991 permit, finding 18, it states as follows. The remaining 288 acres will be used for recreational purposes and preserved as open space. Is where phase three proposed within that 288 acres or is this some other part of the property? And if you don't know, that's fine. We could ask, we, we'll, we'll ask the question and you could in our, in our memo and you could uh, follow up with, follow up on that. Do you, um, I missed the first part of that. What, what were you referencing that states the 288 acres? Sure. So in the 1991 permit, finding 18, uh, there is a, a permit. It's a condition. Findings can be conditions. And it says the remaining 288 acres will be used for recreational purposes and preserved as open space. What I'm trying to figure out is that area, the area where phase three is proposed. I couldn't figure that out and thought maybe you could help out. And if you don't know, we can put the question in our memo and you could walk us through that in a narrative. Um, yeah, I, I don't know with certainty right now, but I would assume that it refers to the remainder of the entire 300 acres that wasn't currently originally opposed to the open space area. I mean, for the gravel pit area. So it's just basically saying the remainder of the land would still be maintained for recreational use. Um, I guess I would go a step further to say that um, the intention of the property for the town was to be used for gravel extraction processes. Originally, this proposed phase three area uh, could become a gravel pit area, but what was phase two is going to be reclaimed and be available to return back to uh, recreational use. So in that sense, it's almost like a wash. Well, I think we may need to ask some follow-up questions because if phase three is in that 288 acres, there may be a Stow Club Highlands analysis you need to do because going back to the 1991 permit, the commission was very sensitive that this gravel pit came after um, people had moved to the area and recreated and it was a it was a significant portion of that initial permit and so um i just want to give you a heads up that we may ask for clarification on the record and then if indeed phase three was is within that 288 acres a stow club highlands analysis because that's um that's still not not clear to me if there's a conflict between that permit condition and what um, you're proposing now. If that proposal condition was in 1991, then uh, phase two would have been a subsequent, uh, a later approval, which would have theoretically been in the same situation as we're in now. So I think uh, I think a little more analysis would need to be done there. 
Yeah, that would be helpful because the what's interesting is that the subsequent permits all say we they they all focus on recreational use. Um, so I think I think it would be helpful to have more analysis because I think the concern is that when there's and this is why the Stoke Club Highlands analysis exists, so that there's not piecemeal development of a property and there's promises made in one permit application that are later no longer there. And sometimes they, they can be changed, obviously, because the world changes and things change and that's there's flexibility built into that analysis. So um, that's something I, I know I would like more information on, so it probably will be in a memo request. And that's all I had for that one. I am very concerned about the um, what appears to be a long-standing condition that's very important to this whole concept of the gravel pit not being applied anymore. Okay, thank you, Jocelyn. So one of the questions that's part of the chat and I think alludes to a concern earlier of Mr. Donahoe is that the trails are going to either be rerouted or completely shut off. And if they were rerouted, uh, then potentially uh, the new route could introduce uh, rec recreational use closer to private property and, and maybe spill onto it. Um, can the applicant clarify whether they will be shut off or if there will be efforts to reroute the trails? Yeah, I think it depends on where the trail is and, and where when it happens. Um, we're more than happy to try to work with the public to reroute them appropriately so that it doesn't impact uh, our neighbors. Um, hi, may I jump in? This is Jude. Yes, please do. Um, when I, uh, a group of us from 10 Bends were, were at a meeting, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know exactly when it was, but it was with the select board and Tyler and Mr. Avery was there and Tyler, you were explaining the whole scenario. And at that meeting, we were told that the trails that were going through the phase three meadow would, would not be complete they would be shut down, but they would be rerouted, that they would just not be closed completely. So uh, this is Tyler. Um, as, I, as I stated, I think it depends on what, what trail and where it is and how it works with the existing trail network. Uh, and where it works with creation of the, the, the future gravel pit. Uh, ideally, we will be able to work with the public to reroute the trails appropriately and keep everything safe and uh, avoid impacts to our neighbors. Okay, thank you. Are there any other uh, questions uh, from Matt or from any of the other parties regarding 9K? So this is Mr. Donahoe again. The only question I have, uh, last question I have is, if the original permit stated that a large portion of the land, 288 acres, would be preserved for recreational use, shouldn't that recreational use be addressed in the application. So I think I, that's what we were exploring and we're going to need more information to understand what's going on there. Yeah. Okay. Because at the last meeting, which was in the, the Teague building, as you saw, it was packed with concerned uh, citizens that recreate over in that location. Uh, it's very that's very a popular location for hikers and mountain bikers and so forth. Understood. Th thank you for for bringing that up. Thanks.
there's any is there anything else from the commissioners that you'd like to bring up? Matt? I don't uh, I don't have any additional questions at this time. The ones that I've mentioned before were the ones that were, you know, I was primarily concerned about, you know, safety and noise, et cetera. So I'm all set for right now. OK. Um, we do have a note here for Criterion 10 um, that we should get a memo uh, and, and this ties into I think what we were just talking about uh, talking about the, the paths and and complying with with the town plan um, and the intended purpose for this. Um, so that will probably be in our follow up memo or order. With that, Father Monley, could could you expand on that statement again? I maybe I just missed the missed the beginning of it. So, so we're just um, we're we're exploring this idea of whether or not the town plan um, has any language about whether or not the recreation paths have to be uh, protected uh, in in some state, um, and so that may be part of a question uh, in our follow up memo or order. Does anyone have anything else they'd like to bring up tonight? Well, I'd like to, uh, this is Don Avery. Uh, this, this is Don Avery. And I'd just like to say that um, if it would, we, maybe we were wrong in not submitting anything. I was wrong in not submitting anything from my higher geologist, but if that would help clarify things, we'd be glad to do that. We. We were kind of, kind of just wait, biding our time on that, but we'd be glad to do that if that would help the commission understand our position or the issues here. I think Did, that would be very helpful for us. Right. This is uh, Commissioner Jocelyn Wilchuk. I would say that um, that information certainly should be submitted to us by the time we have the evidentiary hearing, but the quality of the information is also important. So to the extent that you're still waiting for data and that data will help make your report more comprehensive, th those are all things to, to have in mind. Uh, are, you, are you saying that we should, we should submit it to you even though we're waiting for this information because it'll help you or we should wait for the information to make our analysis better and more complete? Well, I know for me, I'm probably not going to look at anything until there's an evidentiary hearing <laughs> in terms of efficiency and having things fresh in my mind. I don't know about the other commissioners, but my practice usually is I will freshen up um, and review a lot of documents again the day that we have the site visit, which is usually fo followed by the evidentiary hearing. Because if I read something tomorrow, I probably will not remember what it said by the time we have these activities. But, and I know for me personally, I'd rather have quality information instead of, you know, you having something but not have it be complete. But I don't know what Matt and, and Jeremy, how, how their process works. Yeah, so so this is Jeremy. Uh, I, I totally agree. I, I don't want sort of a piecemeal uh, report coming in. Put Good. your best effort forward and, and submit it as one uh, total Good. document. And that's exactly what we had in mind. Thank you very much. This is Tyler Mumley, and on behalf of the uh, the applicant, you know, any information or concerns that uh, people have, it'd, it'd be ideal to get that information as soon as possible so we can address it and and uh, understand it better. Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, Tommy Gardner. Uh, I, I'd rather wait till after everybody else offers testimony testimony before I ask the question ask questions. OK. So with that, I think we are reached the point where we've achieved what we wanted to tonight. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but given the state of affairs, I'm going to ask it anyway. Uh, are the parties willing to waive an in-person hearing and live cross-examination uh, in uh, light of the current uh, social distancing uh, criteria and settle for essentially written testimony and cross-examination uh, 
that would be submitted written. Sorry, I, Jeremy, can the commissioners also talk about that too offline? Because are you thinking that we would have written testimony in cross, but we would have a live hearing to the extent the commissioners had follow up questions? Or so would I, it all be written? Right. So, as I understand the NRB directive, and, and Josh, you can tell me if I'm uh, misinterpreting this, but in lieu of postponing a site visit and a in-person hearing, uh, they're asking that we make the offer to have a, a total written hearing with testimony and cross-examination. Okay, because okay, because I know for me, I need I I need a site visit for this. I don't know. I have not read all the guidance documents, and I don't know what you and Matt think. But a lot of these issues that are coming up are. Um, going to be fleshed out in a site visit. We don't necessarily need to be in the same room for an evidentiary hearing. Um, so I don't know what we're supposed to do in this situation. So do you add, add some, I can add, I can add a little bit of context um, because the circumstances surrounding COVID-19 are so rapidly evolving and ever changing. Um, I think all of us can agree that we don't, we don't know what's going to happen next or what new guidance is going to be in place at the federal or state level the governor is going to do in terms of extending his orders um, so on and so forth um, as of right now state uh, employees and, and state agencies are, are uh, prohibited from conducting site visits in accordance with the governor's stay-at-home order so right now we can't do a site visit um, nor can any state staff do site visits until at least may 15th we don't know if that's going to get extended. Um, who knows? We could get, that could get extended into midsummer if we get a second wave of, of you know, coronavirus. Right. So, so we, we know that ANR needs a site visit. Created a, a few guidance documents with the hopes of anticipating the unknown. And one of the one of those unknowns is when are we going to be able to have a hearing and site visit when all of us can be in relatively close proximity. So the offer that Jeremy made is anticipation of not knowing what we don't know and when or when we when we may be able to convene a site visiting hearing. Um, obviously the applicant is it's in their best interest to move through this as swiftly as possible. It's also in the best interest of um, the adjoining landowners to have their concerns addressed as best as possible. Um, so that's something that we as an organization are offering to applicants and parties if they so choose to um, accept it as an alternative means for getting to, this, to the same end. Um, Jen, this is uh, Commissioner Jocelyn Wilczek. Does ANR need to do a site visit, whether it's with the commissioner on or on your own? Uh, send scientists out there. I thought you said that there was some on the ground work that ANR needed to conduct. Yeah, my sense is that it would be on our own just because I don't think, I think it'll probably take more than a half hour. Right, um, right. So that's what I thought. Yeah, we, we're we hoping to get a site visit set up as soon as the restrictions are lifted to look at um, the the streams that are not identified on the ANR Atlas layers, so we right. can put forth the re recommendations for the riparian buffer protections. So we already know that nothing, like in terms of a hearing or testimony, nothing can happen until ANR has a site visit. And I know for me, even if parties waive that right, I I feel like I cannot fulfill my obligation without going to the site. I'm happy to go to the site by myself with people in my ear, but I just can't fulfill my obligation to the parties without looking at the site. And I'm not trying to make a difficult thing here, but I some sites I never have to see. This site, I I, I really do I really do need to to see to, to understand what's what's going on. So that's just my two cents. Um, I don't know what Matt and Jeremy think in terms of how they their how their what their comfort level is yeah so, jocelyn I, I don't necessarily disagree 
and, and that's why I sort of prefaced it that I think I know the answer, but I'll ask anyway, um, just because, uh, again, that was the guidance for the NRB. And, and if all the parties and and as Josh know, the applicant, um, you know, given the uncertainty uh, with when we may be able to have a, a site visit and and potentially hearing, given that uncertainty, if everybody agreed, then then that wouldn't be a big deal. But um, I, I don't suspect that's the case here. Well, one thing we could do, and, and that kind of follows up on your question of the parties, is maybe we could have a site visit. People are outside. We can stay six feet apart. We could, we could look like beekeepers if we need to. Um, and then maybe the site visit's on one day, but we have this written additional testimony and cross-examination. We can flesh out what that looks like in writing and then we could have a a truncated hearing virtual so that way we're not all in the same room together which i think is more of the concern so i don't know what jeremy or matt think about that but that may be one way to navigate through this situation sure so so josh i had to cut out early this from the the thursday uh call this morning yeah um, can we actually have a hearing virtually or is it written or in person? I believe we can. Okay, okay. I was unclear on that. So yeah, there may be a, a way to split the baby here where we do have an in-person site visit and then um, have, a, have a period of time where there is written testimony and cross-examination followed up by a fairly brief uh, hearing to, to put the finer points on some of these issues. So, so this is Matt, and I just want to mention that I'm a visual person. So for me, and especially this, this is a fairly complicated uh, application. I really would like a site visit if it's possible. That helps me to see and put all the the, the explanation into a context. So I'm open to the rest of the. Um, process being modified to the extent that we can and I'm you know I want to respect the governor's wishes and what he's you know told us all about how he wants us to conduct business but if it's at all possible I really would like a site visit fair enough so with that being said um, I think the commission will uh, discuss the, the timing of that site visit. Josh, are we under any statutory time frame to host that or have that uh, site visit? I think there's a warning period. Um, I would need to follow up on the specifics of that. So I, I don't want to say anything now that that may be misinformation for folks. Okay. Jeremy, one suggestion might be to ask the applicant to propose a schedule, given that no one can do a site visit until at least May 15th. ANR can't go out there. Perhaps the town might want some time to discuss ANR's findings after they go to the site. And I don't know if, if we want to ask the applicant to, to, to give its best shot at a schedule um, with no, it has, it knows more of what it needs to do. Um, that may be one idea. Sure. Good, good, good idea. Uh, any any um, comment, Tyler or Dan? Yeah, I mean, short of uh, knowing the future as far as the um, having the thumb come off the, the lockdown and knowing if May 15th is uh, available date or not, uh, it's hard to tell. Plus, I think um, this pre-hearing conference um, we have to kind of digest the conversation and think about some additional items. Uh, and there's also conversations to be had with, with A&R items. So I, I think it's pretty hard to try to propose something right now. Obviously, it's the applicant's desire to get this done as soon as possible, uh, given that there are operational needs for the town. What about if we, the commission has some homework to do, we need to get out our pre-hearing conference memoranda, which outlines pre preliminary party status and identifies requests for information we may have. What if that's the next step? And then 
we wait we wait until we have better clarity on timing and, and if the applicant at any time wants to send josh a note like hey can we schedule something we can we can do that does that sound i don't know how else to proceed <laughs> other right. than just that way yeah i mean i think our objective should be getting out the the memo and um you know probably our ability to either do a site visit or have a um hearing is going to be probably more clear in, in a week or two so um yeah if if it's unless there's an objection from the parties or the applicant let's let's go that route and say we're going to focus on getting the memorandum out and uh the schedule is is in flux and uncertain at this time for um other activities uh don avery here I, I just like to say that I'm uh, totally in agreement that it's really important in this case to have a site visit. I've been on a number of site visits where we're sort of rushed and truncated and so on, and I think we really need to take our time on this one because there's a lot to see. And I would like to have um, be able to submit a list of locations um, that I would like to have the commission visit. I don't. It's it's all just sort of along the way. They're going to be traveling anyway, but I'd like to make sure they saw a certain certain perspectives. Um, as far as uh, um, well, I guess that's that's really all I can say. I, I guess I'm in the same water as everybody else, trying to do these things blind. I I would like to have a real opportunity to question um, the applicants, witnesses, both Mr. Mumley and Mr. Ross. I look forward to that. I'm not particularly trained in that, but I would like. I have some real. I really wanted to talk to them about the way they approach this project. And I, I, I just can't really see doing that on the telephone, but I, I will do that if that's what everyone else really wants to do. Uh, meanwhile, thank you for your opportunity to put my 10 cents in there today. And Mr. Avery, one thing I, I think I really want to emphasize is um, in this Act 250 process, information sharing and discussion with the applicant can be really valuable. And sometimes there can be agreements reached between you and the town that we as Act 250 commissioners may not have authority to address. Um, we may or we may not, but um, you may gain more certainty and predictability by a free exchange of information with the town um, and trying to work things out. Obviously, we are. this is a yeah. part of the process, but I. it sounds to me like the town doesn't have all of the information you have and is open to receiving that. Now, whether they take your information and do what you'd like is a different story, but I think it would be great over these next few weeks um, to, 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 to try to, for the town and uh, Avery to share as much information as as the, you can. The only information to be shared is what my hydrogeologist came up with, and they now have, have hired a hydrogeologist to come up with something, and it came up with something relatively meaningless. But I, I don't want me to be rude, but I would like to say this. That I have, this isn't the point to argue this, time to argue this, but I have made every effort to communicate with the town. I have emails that I sent to them to sit down with me two years ago to talk about these issues. They never once sat down with me. The, the the town administrator and the chair of the of the board refused to sit down and share with me. I have been excluded from this process, and so I'm feeling not feeling too, you know, the sharing business doesn't really seem to work with them. And I hate to say that, but that's exactly what's happened. It's a very very sad. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the spring issue is a is a very important issue that I hope all parties who are involved in that take take very, very seriously. That's all I'll, I'll say about that. Yeah. Well, I will, I'll definitely, you know, to help everybody at this moment, and we'll definitely uh, get in touch with um, Jeff Hoffer and have him um, get to work and finish up whatever he was going to submit. Uh, it wouldn't be maybe our final, well, oh, you, in, in the sense, you really tell me you really don't really want it till the, till the hearing date. Would it? Would, uh, That's right. Com completion and quality is 
yeah. is most it's, important, as Jeremy mentioned. Yeah, in that case, we really kind of need to see really what the, what the A&R is asking, what their real comments are. We best have a bare outline of that. Right. Um, I, I, yeah. We understand that an A&R can't even go out until May 15th, and that doesn't mean they're going to go yeah. out on May 16th. So I think we, we all know that data and facts are going to be collected, and yeah. we'll have that in mind. Like, I just want you to know, I want to move this forward too. I'm not trying to slow things down. I'm in the same, in the same difficulty with this COVID business. I, I have a, my nursery trying to get opened up to sell our plants, the last of our plants, after 40 years in business, and we're sort of shut down like everybody. Fair enough. Thank you, Mr. Avery. I appreciate it. Thank you. So with that, I think we've we've done what we can do tonight. Uh, Commissioners, I don't know if we want to uh, have a brief conversation tomorrow or later tonight. Well, I think, um, Jeremy, this is my fault because I cut you off and I have a bad habit of doing that. But you asked the question of everyone about whether they'd be open to not having a live hearing but doing it in writing. And Mr. Avery said he could live with it, although it's not ideal, but maybe we should hear from the applicant and the other parties preliminary status parties, if they would object to having um, the hearing part be um, be via writing, if you will. Or virtual. Or virtual, right. It would be, Not it would be a combination. A combination, yeah. Uh, Mr. Crandall or uh, anybody from the applicant want to speak to that? This is Tyler. Um, I think the answer to that depends on what the uh, what the, the scope of the meeting would be. I think uh, that we would need to have the ability to uh, share information and kind of interact with the information, such as showing a site plan and pointing to an area that we're talking about. So I think it would depend heavily on how interactive the uh, virtual meeting was uh, so that we could be sure that um, our, our points and our, and our messaging and our um, are, are clearly shown and conveyed. Understood. Thank you. Uh, Don, Donnie, I'd just like to say that um, I we have, especially since this crisis has occurred, we've had very intermittent internet service. So any virtual things that happen, I don't know if we can do it here. Understood. Yeah, this is Nick uh, Crandall from Ten Bens. I have no problem doing a virtual, um, another virtual meeting or hearing, but um, you know, a site visit would obviously uh, illuminate a lot of questions um, and and make them more clear, I guess. So, when and if that's possible, I'd, I'd support that too. Okay, so I think there's broad consensus to, at the very least, uh, have a site visit and um, let us do our. Uh, post um, hearing memo or pre-hearing conference memo and uh, we will certainly count on a site visit that will be scheduled at a later date and um, at that time or, or as this process progresses we can decide how to move forward with either written testimony followed up by a virtual hearing or written testimony followed up by a in-person hearing. Uh, folks, uh, Tommy Gardner here with that paper, if I may uh, ask a couple of questions about the uh, the process. Okay. Uh, uh, a couple of things. One one thing, uh, just immediately, specifically, seeing that uh, this is a public hearing, uh, is the uh, an, an intention that anybody who uh, offered testimony in the like the chat of this of this uh, remote meeting be made a public record as well. No. The, the, Josh, you may be able to help. This is Commissioner Wilczek. People are using the word testimony, but this is not, this is not a, uh, as I understand it, this isn't a, an evidentiary hearing, meaning nope. this is a pre-hearing conference for people to flesh out issues and have a general discussion so that issues can be narrowed for, for the hearing when we're actually taking evidence but i don't i did not view this as um as testimony but josh what are is that 
that's my understanding of the pre-hearing conference. This was not a, a hearing. Yeah. This was a meeting. You're correct. So this is an okay. this is a is a, I mean, the spectrum of in, informal proce informal proceeding. Um, nothing that while this pre-hearing conference as a whole is then recorded and will be uploaded and made publicly available. Um, nothing that's been said is, is being considered official testimony, as Justin, Justin indicated, it's to flesh out issues, um, to create a more efficient and streamlined process moving forward. Um, so nothing in the chat is testimony. And I will say, if we do end up at a place where we're doing a virtual hearing, nothing in the chat is going to be considered a testimony. Um, so kind of, you can, Put the chat to the side. That, that's more of a kind of a, a tool to facilitate things uh, and make this process a little bit smoother for people that have questions that perhaps can be answered on the side um, with just some typing and, instead of um, question Q and A. But correct me if I'm wrong. If this uh, was not a pandemic, this pre-hearing would be happening during a publicly warned and publicly held select board meeting, right? No, right, and no. where there'd be no chat. This feature. would not be a select board meeting. It, it, this was publicly warned and, and it technically is publicly held. The only thing that would be different is if, if, if there were no coronavirus is that this would be happening in person rather than remotely. That's the only difference between an in-person pre-hearing conference and a remote one. Um, and we wouldn't be videotaping the pre-hearing conference, right, Josh? It's Perfect. there would be no videotape. It would be, wouldn't it be your little tape recorder? It would be a tape recorder and notes, yeah. Audio, yeah. All right. Well, as you've already acknowledged, there's there's there's, there's a there's a concern about ha having a a future physical site visit, um, which is at this point within the coronavirus uh, uh, undetermined. I'm just concerned that the first that the newspaper received notice of this select board meeting and the SAC 250 hearing and all the party status deadlines associated with it was on Tuesday at 9.12 a.m. Can the you explain it appears the receipt of that notice? Are you, are you uh, on the certificate of service as a newspaper? We are the, we're the newspaper of record. That's all I can say as far as our, our, our official affiliation with the town. And it appears that in order to join the online chat, which these people who have been chatting in it, apparently, uh, uh, you had to have signed up by yesterday. That's just 24 hours notice from the- uh, Well, that's not, yeah. So there, there was much more than 24 hours notice. This was, I don't recall the newspaper of record, but this was um, noticed in a newspaper weeks ago. Um, so there was, there was much more than 24 hours notice uh, public notice available to interested parties um, i can see if i can pull that up right now yeah, what um, i'm looking at is on the a and r website is the uh, act 250 agenda issued friday april 3rd 2020 and i don't see anything other than a and r programs uh, uh comments due 410 which is three days ago tommy you, you represent the news and citizen correct yes yes that's true. that's right we transmitted a letter to the news and citizen on march 30th I'm requesting that they public, pub, uh, publicize the hearing notice in your in your newspaper. Um, so that in itself should have been noticed. Um, and it was and it was it was warned for Thursday at 4:30. Correct. Thursday, April 16th at 4:30 p.m. All right. Just uh, just yeah, just making sure because we're 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 losing a lot of the um, the the regular like flow of public meetings. For instance, Morristown Select Board meeting meets every other Monday at 6.30 and it, and it hasn't in a while. And I'm seeing that a lot in other towns that are that are like post town meeting, your reorganization meeting sets the times for your regular meetings. And the these meetings are now being held at, at, at varying different times. And we just got the warning for this Select Board meeting on Tuesday, which gave people 48 hours to know about this meeting, which gave people less than 48 hours to actually 
you know, uh, apply to be able to chat or whatever it is. I'm just, so I'm just concerned, and I just want to share my concerns about that any, any kind of movement which is going forward gets duly noticed in the paper with enough time to actually warn it. I time, I think there's a, some, some misunderstanding here. Um, this is not a select board meeting, and the, this, this, Tommy, this was published on April 2nd in your newspaper. Okay. In the, in the legal maybe, so so two weeks I ago. Apologize. Perhaps, I, perhaps my concerns ought to be expressed to the, uh, the, the municipality then. Any other questions, Tommy? I'm good with that. Thank you. Okay. Um, Jeremy, just one last housekeeping issue, just so no one is caught off guard with the report and order. Um, another thing that we did flag that was flagged for us um, from our enforcement officer is that there has been there. I, I don't know what permit or what permit condition, um, but at one point there was a permit condition included that required annual reporting of extraction rates. And so that was flagged uh, for us by our enforcement officer um, based on past non-compliance with that issue. So we will be including a request for, um, to the extent that you have them in your records for annual extraction rates going back to the beginning of this, this, uh, this gallop it. Okay, thank you. And that, that ties nicely into one of my earlier questions. So, so I, I think we're done. Uh, I'll sort of pose a question to Josh and the rest of the commissioners. Do we want to get together tomorrow to discuss content of the memo um, via conference call or another Teams meeting? Is that, is that the next step? It's getting a little late in the evening tonight, but I suppose we could if, if we wanted to plow through. I would propose tomorrow, and just for everybody that's listening, um, to clarify that this would be off the record um, deliberations amongst the commission, um, so there is no public access to that. Correct. Sorry. Yep. So, so this is Matt, uh, Matt Kraus. I, I, I'm fine with that. I have a uh, early morning meeting, but um, I should be in late morning uh, to do that. But I also would think maybe uh, this should come from you, Jeremy, that we should thank all the participants and the parties here for participating under trying circumstances. It's tough for us all. Um, but, you know, we want, we should thank them for the, their conduct and how they've, you know, pitched in and, and, and done well under the circumstances. I don't think we should, you know, let that go by. Good, good point, Matt. And I definitely be, uh, appreciate everybody bearing with our uh, challenges here from the technological perspective. And certainly, uh, this is not ideal, so appreciate the patience both tonight and moving forward. Okay, so um, commissioners, we'll talk tomorrow morning via email to try to set up a time. I'm pretty well committed to other things all tomorrow afternoon, um, so it might even be Monday, um, but we'll we'll try to set something up tomorrow morning. Okay. Yeah, Great, good. thank you. Thank you all for your participation. We greatly appreciate um, all that you've had to offer here today. Well, we all thank you also. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Stay safe out there. We do the same, thanks. This is the uh, Morristown Select Board. We just finished up with the Act 250 hearing. We were on both lines. If anybody's there, please identify yourself for the record. Tommy Gardner, hey. How are you guys okay, doing? Thanks, Tommy. We just went um, anybody else? Okay, thank you. So we we have a few other agenda items, um, and I'll ask the chair just to, to carry on with the rest of the meeting. All right, we'll move into the next next one. Approve the minutes. The minutes of March twenty fourth, twenty twenty. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Next, community concerns. Do we have any community concerns tonight? 
Hearing none, I don't believe we have any liquor control. <laughs> move to new business. New business, review, review and approve the mowing bids. Um, yes, we sent this out a while back. We were planning on having an earlier meeting um, for May 6th. Um, unfortunately, the regular schedule is all off. So, he and I did review the meeting, and from our review of the bids, I think Spalding's bids was the most favorable. Um, if we put this bid specification in there, we had one company that didn't include the Oxbow mowing in it. R and R, yeah. Um, and we specifically, I, I think they may be the ones that called me and I specifically said, I don't want to bid just for the cemeteries. I, I want one for the whole project. It wouldn't make sense if I separate it out from somebody. So, um, I think um, was the most favorable thing to work out. But the, because that one doesn't have the Oxbow, then we don't know what that's going to be. Exactly. We didn't know what that's going to be. I don't want to try to get separate contractors to go mow the Oxbow and then somebody right. else mow the and you didn't receive a bid from the current person who's That's right. I made sure I contacted them and actually asked them to, to give me a bid to the yeah. clean up down there, and I haven't heard anything from them. So we reached out to them specifically from you know last year's but they did a great job for the yeah. And who was that? Um Apex, Apex. Scott Droney. Yeah. Well actually he was in the office one day I talked to him personally, but I don't know what happened. I knew they were feeling pretty beat up about doing it. They they felt like they didn't weren't charged enough last year. Okay. So I make a motion we approve the uh, mowing with Isaac Spalding. And the price Isaac Spalding. Oh, that's what you said, right? Yeah. Twelve thousand for the season. And the bid for the Oxbow is $100 per month. All right, I have a motion. For occurrence. Yeah. Per month. I, I just wanted to ask, I wasn't here, sorry. Um, what about the RR property? Okay. Dan just talked about he didn't include the, uh, the Oxbow in his quote, um, his bid. But I really liked his proposal. Right, but the bid is incomplete. Um, the Oxbow could be. <laughs> Okay. Significantly more. Yeah, I, I would like to have, if we go with the uh, with the folding, I'd like to have put a proposal or information together like the other guy did. Okay. I'm I, I'm losing my energy because I should be eating by now, and so I may have to leave. Okay. Um. So if we we can just put out. I can have it I, itemized. Yeah, not itemized. So I have a motion. Do I have a second on that? Can I just make one clarification? According to the state rules right now, landscapers aren't allowed to be out Right. So, you know, I'm asking the board to draw the contract, and then once the restrictions are lifted, it's been out. I actually haven't started doing the work. I think that's very important that everybody understands that. Right Get a second on that motion. So I, uh, I'll second it for discussion purposes. Yeah, I just want to make sure Isaac is planning on doing the same thing that R&R &R has yeah. outlined in there. Actually, I spoke both of them. They had a list of cemeteries. Everybody knew about that. R&R &R is pretty, pretty explicit on what they... They are. They just don't have oxbow. Yeah, it's a good to, not, right, no, I understand that. But as far as the rest of it, it could be five grand for the oxbow. Yeah. No, I, I understand that part of it. So I have a motion and a second. Is there any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion is passed. Next, old business. Or oh, we'll do the new business. We'll do. Uh, Mud City Loop report. Tyler, you want to touch on that for us? Yeah, so uh, so we completed the survey. It's a little bit longer than we expected. Uh, the condition 
around the town where they're trying to get survey done, but that's done in Japan, and uh, I can copy of that stand, completed by Gilson the Mine Survey. And we also completed uh, the hydraulic analysis because we analyzed the entire watershed area size, uh, you know, for different water quality, rainfall events, basically in accordance with VTRAN standards. So some of that VTRAN is usually due they weren't able to get it done, so we got it done. Um, so that's completed. So now we know that the size of the pipe, we have a survey to work on it, and we're, we're working on drafting the site plan right now. So once that's complete, uh, we'll submit it to stream alterations the State Department. Uh, we believe that's the only permit we're going to need. We'll probably throw it by the Army Corps and also weapons, but uh, right now it doesn't look like they'll have any say in it. Looks like it'll be just a strings permit. Uh, we've already got strings involved. It's also one of the reasons that I developed now it took a little bit longer to need some input from them. But so we'll get the strings permit, and then we'll have some hands that we can compile the bid documents and ship that out and get the bid. Uh, as I was explaining earlier, one of the concerns as far as timing goes is going to be the ability for the, the concrete box cover to be constructed uh, with this coronavirus shutdown. Um, I know that FD Ireland and Camp Three Castle will shut down right now, so the production is on hold. Um, we can try to look at other uh, other plants in the area. We go to New Hampshire and kind of look at look at other areas that might have other opportunities. But I guess that they're probably also on hold. So we certainly want to get the bid ready to get out uh, as quickly as possible, so that when this all stops, you know, we can be top of the list for a for a box. So that's the streams that for Anna. So you send yourself with them for review to get a permit. Uh, that'd be pretty good. The guy's name is Chris Bernal. He's the base in charge of stream alteration, and he's usually uh, usually very responsive and also easy to work with. Chris is yeah, he, he actually when we call Chris he works pretty Chris is very good at responding. Yeah, I know. Yeah. So again, I think we have a rough timeline of when people can see it. Yeah, I, I think that we can get the site plan and the application in front of it for the next couple of weeks. Oh, okay. Uh, next question. Is it going to be feasible for us to open one line of the festival or is it all the little drop? Uh, you know. We have bounced around with an idea. I don't know. Based on the original analysis, and I haven't, uh, sorry, I haven't, I haven't been out there since the snow melted and it's still looking bad as it was. Um, the answer is no. Uh, I, I think if we wanted to go to the extreme, potentially there's an opportunity to maybe add some, some base and extend the edge of the road out and use a portion of the pipe that is still in good shape. The majority of the pipe uh, deflections on the high inlet side. Uh, the lower outlet side seems to, to, to still be in fairly good shape, but I think that'd be a lot of work to, to do that if you, if you wanted to do that. Whereas the, the, the better long term solution is um, the way, still the way to go. I don't know. I don't know. What to go. I, just, I know that this has been a lot of people residents up there, and I didn't want them to have a false hope going forward. So we were going to, at least for a temporary period, hold off while making that forward. Yeah, I think as it stands right now, with the situation out there, as it stands right now, that's not a good thing. Okay. What I would recommend, though, let's say we get into a situation, and I'll talk about the Travis Bridge discussion. Let's say we get into a situation where we can't get timely, over the price, when I say timely, which I call construction season this year, then I think moving the road over a little bit and going one leg may make sense at that point. I, yeah. I realize if we move it up or then we're also increasing our construction costs. But whatever we put in, we got to remove. So I think, you know, we'll see if, if we get to this point where we know we can't get a box cover installed, I think we go to option D and move it over to just one lane strictly for our traffic. I 
would much rather deal with the month, but we have a We really have a sense for taxpayers and responsibility of care to get that next one to the year. And if the lot's going to stay restricted about that, you can't get that lot for the year. It's not an option for a lot of concern. You don't have a picture of that. Yeah. And that means we think this year, and if we can't get the box over to the lot this year, then we're just going to make that. Yeah. Is it premature to get on the list to have it made? Do you know the size or? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll know the design size really quickly. You know, obviously the, the correct way to do things is to get the design back, get the permits in hand, get the bid out, get responses back, award a contractor, and then that contractor, uh, you know, orders the box. Yeah, I, I understand that. So maybe there's an alternative method. Well, I understand that, but like, if you know the size, and I've done this a hundred times. The town purchases the culvert because they can get on the list, get ahead of, like now. I mean, if you know, if you're satisfied that the size of the culvert that you've got designed is going to be approved, get on the list with Camp or Ireland. And just as soon as they're able to go into production, the town purchases the culvert and, uh, yeah, I mean, I know. I think that's certainly an option. I think one of the things you run risk of there is if the town's going to purchase the culvert, then the contractor's not going to really be charged to have a loss of the uh, bid, right? Oh, I, I you, might, you, might, you, might, well, you might lose. You might lose a little contractor bid here. Uh, you might get a smart higher price. Smart contractor is going to add twenty percent to the price of culvert anyway, and put it in, so and not have to spend the money to buy it. Yeah, I think that's something to do. Like, of course, you know, and uh. I know we've done it both ways in the past, and uh, the contractor is going to get his markup either way. But I understand that you don't have total control of the project that way either, but if you're dependent on somebody else or delivery schedule and that type of thing. So. Right. You might improve the timeline. But, yeah. But in order to get it built. Yeah. Like I said, I think typically when our experience do call it, Gary, obviously, you have a lot of experience, so I'm not trying to override it. I think typically we're, we would advise to say let the contractor handle it um, so that all the company's taking a fair deal. But in this situation, maybe that's the better route to go. Have, yeah. the town, have the town versus Culver. As soon as we know the size, we could try to put, try to put a purpose over it. Yeah, that's what I'm, I mean. Try to beat the deadline. Yeah. You get the first one out when it comes out. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Sounds good. Thanks, Tyler. Yeah, absolutely. Any questions for Tyler? Thank you. Thank you. Tina, do you want to talk about the unemployment insurance? Um, yeah, I just printed this out so that you would be aware of what we pay um, on an annual basis for unemployment. Our rate right now is 1.19%, which is probably the best ever been. Um, we go through a we go through Vermont League of Cities and Towns who employs a third party to handle all our unemployment stuff called Equifax. So when someone applies for unemployment, that information goes from unemployment to Equifax and they request information from me to verify people's wages. I give it to Equifax and then they give it to unemployment and the checks get written or whatever. That's how it has been in the past. So that's how I'm assuming it's going to continue to be. Um, I just thought that I'd let you know what the yeah, process is. It's not traditional like um, like any other business. It's not, you know, you don't deal just with unemployment. You deal with a third party first. So our our annual cost is $9,800, right? That's right. And that, that changes year to year. Um, you know, but from what we know with BLCT, our unemployment trust, you know, for cities and towns, is right. healthy right now. Um, from what we know from what the feds are saying, and the interest, you know, any of this thing's not going to affect our, what's the term I'm looking for? It's not going to affect our, 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 rate, our experience yeah. rating. Right. Um, in this particular case, too, you know, the federal government's kicking in some money for unemployment. That can fairly kick in half of what the normal unemployment would be. So the, the trust being healthy, you know, I'm not going to say that nobody's going to tell you that there may not be a increase in our rates. Right. But, you know, 
know, it, it won't be based on our experience. Mm -hmm. And it's once again, it's just to get to keep the trust healthy. I think the LCT has done a good job of definitely doing that stuff for us. So that when we do get a situation like this, you know, we're you know, not a financial burden on the yeah. trust. That's one of the things I wanted to ask because when we were weighing the decision to put people on unemployment, I wanted to know what it, what it actually cost us to do it. Yeah, it's all based on a, a, our experience rating and they base it on our estimated payroll for the year. Right. So, you know, I mean, then they, they do a true up, if you will. Yeah. And so if your estimated taxable payroll goes down, your rate, even if your rate right. goes up a little, you may not see a huge difference. Right, but that's why it changes all the time. Okay. That's right. Okay, thank you for giving us that. That makes that help. Perspective. <clears throat> all right, next, we'll move to old business. Review and approve the bid for the highway department dump body. I want you guys to start this for Kevin. Last, the last time around, you guys approved the dump body from local. And that was an average body. Yeah. Um, I think there's some differences between the average body and the NG body. Um, it's a lot thicker, it's a lot heavier duty. The MG body is still cheaper, I don't think it's as long as it is than the body from Mike. Uh, we just want to get the, the better body for sale, so rather than the average body, we want to get the MG body. And it's heavier duty, it'll last longer than what we do. Um, it, it, it's going to probably save some like, maintenance money anyway. So. It looks like it's like $3,300 difference or something. Yes, you know, so it's, it's the better body. It's, it's worth the $3,300. Yeah. Sounds like it. Yeah, I know that is a better one. We've talked about that in the past dump truck yeah, body. Yeah. That, was, that was a problem with, with the spiritual love body. You guys found out there are about meetings, but the, the spiritual love body is a great for the village. They work because all they do is small stands and clock on all stands and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, our, the highway trucks are used to build roads and all gravel and stone. Right. But that doesn't get used to help. That's why we, well, years ago, it did. This was just uh, the right one was the way to go. This one with this other body. Because again, it's easier than one pair of so, Right. Um, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm all in favor of this. But that's, I was concerned about the pair of body. Rowan has showed me when I first saw the board. They will not hold up. Right? So, yeah. mm -hmm. That little box when the paint comes up, I'm almost yeah. so, 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 yeah, I remember this conversation like 10 years ago, Brian. But you had brought it up, so I think it's that's good. Can you can you tell me why the MG body is heavier duty than the Everest? <laughs> Got exactly the same. Exactly the same steel. All right. Now maybe I'm relying on what I was told. It's built different. Mm -hmm. It's the same same construction. Three sixteenths Corten construction with three sixteenths AR four fifty four. Yeah. I, I guess I'm relying upon the, the experience of the, the crews that the Do you have experience with that, Gary? From an off? Yeah, yeah, we always bought the best one, but Yeah, I bet you did. Well, no, it's because it, but we we use them from one truck to another. For, right. You guys probably don't do that. Yeah, I don't understand that because there was I mean, I know Monoshes probably get used a lot harder than anything the town does at all. Whatever, and we got a 1998 Mac. Still running the same. They don't body. get the salt problem. Yeah, still running the same body. So I, I understand the salt, but we all salt the same. Yeah. That was my concern on the last one we voted for the divide. Second body was the more we like to build that better, better model. I know, I know some of them. Yeah. So do I hear a motion on this? I don't know. <laughs> so why don't we we not something we have to have decided tonight? Well I think it's the same Yeah, if we need more information, once again, you know, I am relying on the groups what what they tell me. But we can come back. It's not something we have to, to do tonight. You know, we already we've already approved the other five. We need to get more information so we can make 
Okay. But both these bodies are put Fairfield. Yes, so they're both supplied by Fairfield, yes. See, that was my issue. It wasn't the cost, and the I local. thought it was cheaper. But if it was way different, but if we're getting a little bit better one, we're still under what the other one. But the biggest part I wanted to do was in town if we could. So we've been buying Viking body for a dump truck to come to us for some time now. Mm -hmm. And we did that specifically because we needed that heavier base. Yeah. yeah. So even but though then, we're a mobile vendor, it's a better product than the home factory product that most of But Doug said, Doug sat here and said he liked
the whole crux of the whole thing is education. The, the Attorney General stresses to us education. Do not arrest anybody, do not, you know, do your best to try to just get people to go along right. with the program. In extreme cases, you know, and once we do that, the ones that we have had, once we got things straightened out, that was two weeks ago or more. Now, but once we got things straightened out, we've only had like four column violations, two violations, if you want to call them that. Some of them are after the fact, so on so forth. You know, we reached out to the people, apparently, there hasn't been any other problems. You don't act until you get another complaint. Yeah. So, but today, just there was a question on some businesses that were open, and like a good contractor supply for instance, uh, the business is not a good employee. You know, everybody's wanting tractor supply. And Menard, too. Menard, they're they're trying to regulate what? Well, they've got people coming in, they've got out of hand custody. We didn't find out about it until today. So a lot of this is an issue, too. We're not getting it until the next day. And then you get misinformation. You don't go in there. Three people, Maxwell, that's it. You know, that's all well, they're letting in the store. So, no, that one is not all we're talking to. You, so. But the question is asked today by the Assistant Attorney General what I thought was essential businesses in town. Well, not my personal. <laughs> <laughs> Liquor store. <laughs>
and by you to be something that's tough for you to understand. So, yeah. Um, the upside of it is that, you know, in a month, we're going to save $120,000 or something like that, you know? Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. 60000 every two weeks. It's a little over 23000 with the people we furloughed per payroll. So that's twice a month, but that doesn't count the retirement or the FICA and Medi right. or any right. of those other. So that's just strict salary. So it, could be so it is significant saving for the town. Um, cash flow, you yeah, know, we're Tina and I had a conversation about that. You know, so far we're good on tax flow or cash flow. Um, you know, comp it up, you know, that we're, we're moderated to get into the situation where we'll, we'll get a short term loan in place, tax anticipation that looks like what we do. So, you know, we can make all those things work. Um, it's a little bit of uncharted territory, but, you know, we're, we're going to continue to make it work. So, um, Sounds good. Yeah. For any other business? I just want to ask a Hypothetical. If for some reason, let's say the pit didn't get approved, what would it cost the town? A lot of money. Um, a fortune to buy gravel and right, Gary? It'd be interesting information to share with the people who have these concerns. Yeah. What is the cost of the yard? Gary, I would say the average one would be about 11, 10 to 11 dollars the yard to stay in, and then it was anywhere from 12 to 14 dollars for gravel. Besides Don Avery, though, most people that are against it are uh, high track residents. So, um, just, just thinking about it, you know, if they have, we have kind of a figure, just, it'd be nice. I'd like to know. I'd like to know how much it's going to cost the taxpayer if the pit doesn't get approved. We use between 7000 to $9,000 a year. That's $10,000. Ten dollars a year is about ninety thousand dollars. Well, the gravel. Well, the gravel. Yeah. So you're talking about maybe two hundred thousand dollars. It's a lot of money. Every year. Probably more than that. Every year, because the price is going to go up. Okay. And plus, there's like there's really a, a longer haul that we can for it on. Oh right. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so your gas yeah. will go up and your wear and tear on your vehicle. All right. All that stuff's going to go up. Two hundred thousand. Well, I'm not sure where you're going to get screen sand either. Yeah. The only thing we could do is be just buy something and screen it down the shop instead of the ferry down there. Screen it. Yeah. But, I mean, no, bank, bank run gravel is uh, about the closest you're going to get to eating now. Right. First seat's pit, right? They do still got some sand in there. NATO, yeah, you can buy NATO sand. But, uh, no, you're talking ten, twelve dollars a ton. It's not a yard. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, Manash got a pit in Eden, and Percy's got one in Lowell. Yeah. Pretty much it now. Yeah. Like exactly. Park's got their own, and and they're looking for another. But it's still expanded. I think so. Maybe expanded. Yeah, they. But they. Last I know, they were still hauling. I guess you can still get some from Harrison. But, uh, I know they were still supplementing. I think they supplemented last year. Some good yeah. sand to, to put into theirs. So I'm not. I'm not 100 percent sure of that. But. All right. Any other business? Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Hey guys, hey, it's Tommy. Tommy again, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, Tommy. Hey, yeah, I just wanted to clarify. Uh, my apologies. Um, I I didn't read the print edition of my paper because sometimes it doesn't come because I don't go to the office anymore. But the A and R uh, hearing was in the uh, April third edition, so I I, I I well I wanted to just clarify that uh, for the record. So thank you guys. And I hope you you're all we did we I didn't finish most of that Tommy. No, we didn't hear you. Sorry, is that better? Uh, a little bit. Oh uh, yeah. I just want to can say you hear hey, us? I, uh, Yeah, I can hear y'all. Just I clarified that I, I hadn't seen the uh 
the uh, A&R agenda come across in the uh, April 3rd paper, but it was in the print edition, which I didn't get because I don't go to the office very often. So uh, uh, I hope you're all doing well and uh, have a good night. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Tommy. Have a good night, Tommy. Hello. 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 Oh, here we say hi. Hi. I have. Thanks. Hello. Is anyone else there? Can you hear me? I can Hello? hear you. I can oh. hear you. I think I lost Dan or the board. Who's this? This is Mike uh, from Green Mountain Access. Oh, hey, Mike. It's Tommy. <laughs> hey, Tommy. How's it going? Uh, <laughs> I think we lost him there at the last second, so yeah. <laughs>